There we go. Okay. Oh. Hello. Hi. Welcome to the Library of Alexandria. And today, guys, today, you do not even understand the treat <laughs> I have in store for you. I have with me, sitting with me to speak all the way from Australia, the inestimable Richard Swan, <laughs> author of Boosh, Justice of Kings, one of my top 10 books that I read last year. Um, first book in the Empire of the North trilogy. Wolf, wolf sorry. Um, Empire of the Wolf. Sorry. That's right. Empire of the Wolf <laughs> trilogy. <laughs> they both ended in a sort of air fish. So which, is the, yeah, which is the um, which is the the Sovan Empire. And uh, man, it is getting so much good buzz, Richard. It is. I think Orbit had done a, a really good job of stoking the fires of anticipation, just spreading some money around, which is, uh, which is <laughs> handing out free books like sweets. <laughs> and don't you, haven't you, uh, like, uh, abducted many people's families in exchange many. for positive reviews? My, yeah, I've got a few black sites kind of dotting around, uh, you know, the countryside. So I just... I, I, I'm, that joke is kind of... I feel like it's running out of a bit of a steam now. I've, I've, I've kept it going for as long as I can, but I feel like... Sometimes I feel like reviewers tag me in to try and get that kind of joke. And I'm like, yeah. oh, I'll just, I just retweet it now. <laughs> well, that's because you've had so many, like, you had so many good reviews. Like, It's a good problem to have, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, you didn't expect <laughs> to have to use it so freaking often. That's right. Yeah, just a couple, I thought. Um, so that is awesome. Well, tell us about, you know, tell us about yourself and about this book. I Because I've been hyping it freaking everywhere. Especially You're an absolute my, hype beast, Alan. Look, yeah, propaganda yeah. Machine, propaganda machine. That's it. Um, and that's the money well spent. Um, so yeah, basically, my name is Richard. Uh, I am a 32-year-old man from England. I currently live in uh, Sydney. So, um, and I'm a, I, I was a litigator. I'm currently writing full time at the moment to see how far I can take that before uh, <laughs> financial exigencies mean I have to return to work. But um, at the moment, <laughs> I'm spending my time writing um, the Empire of the Wolf trilogy. So um, I've been writing for a number of years. I think, as you know, um, basically, like you know, like many other writers, I kind of started in my early teens. Um, I self-published a little bit around about 2015, 2016, and then um, kind of returned to my kind of traditional goal of getting properly published, yeah. um, which obviously has... Uh, has paid off uh, as an investment of, of time and effort. So, um, you know, that's 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 kind of me in a nutshell. And the Empire of the Wolf trilogy kind of uh, it really was was born of a number of different things. I mean, I don't know if you want to talk about inspirations now. Of course, or that of course, because you're going to mention Cicero, which I love. I'm going. <laughs> you're just waiting in the wings. Always, always for any historical references I can. Yeah. Do. You know, I was a Latin teacher. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, the um basically like yeah so for, i i trained as a lawyer i met you know sort of 10 years or so ago and um i i, I had this idea of kind of fantasy lawyers in my head for, just sort of bubbling away in the background for quite a long time and i the, the initial idea and kind of where the justice of kings ended up but you know the they are poles apart but essentially it was kind of like a sort of fantasy courtroom drama in which the lawyers would be kind of utilizing you sort of, what I in my head was like legomancy, so it was kind of like legal nice. magic. So it was like, yeah, so, awesome. <laughs> so it was like you know the ability to kind of, which you know, the, which is the emperor's voice now. But it was like, I, what, I mean, what would a litigator, what magical powers would a litigator want? Right, they would want like the ability to kind of you know get you to confess to a crime, you presuming you've actually done it, or you know the ability to um, you know speak to the victims of crime, you know. Or, Sorry, dead victims, I should clarify. Um, because if they can speak to victims of crime now, that's just a regular thing. <laughs> <laughs> and um, you know, and so, so I was just kind of working through and then I think yeah, three or four years after I kind of qualified as a lawyer, I read Imperium by Robert Harris, which as yes. you know, Alan, that's is the Cicero. first in the Cicero trilogy, um, which is uh, which is a fantastic trilogy of novels, which sort of charts the life of great Roman. Is he a consul? I can't, it, yeah, his tribune, he was a consul in sixty three BC. Oh, there you go. A big deal about it because Catiline tried to overthrow the Republic. I'm going to keep throwing up these. these Alan, just was it? Uh, <laughs> did he make tribune or was that more of a? <laughs> 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 and um, yeah, and so it's shots the life of Cicero. And um, but again, you know, one of the and it's great. You know, it's a great series of novels. But one of the great um, things about it and people who kind of read the Justice of Kings will recognize it straight away is it's not told by Cicero, it's told by Tiro, who is Cicero's slave. Um, but he's not a slave in a kind of 
a bad way. He's a kind of slave in a kind of, you know, the Romans had slaves and he was kind of more of a clerk and a, you know, secretary and he was, you know, very well looked after. Um, so he was a kind of indentured, but he wasn't like a kind of backbreaking labor in the, yeah. you know, the fields. Cicero kind of freed him. Cicero freed him before his death. Yes, exactly. So he was benign slavery insofar as, you know, yeah. that concept exists. Um, and so it's told, it, he is telling the events of Cicero's life um, and death. And um, and I, I loved that that plot frame. I thought, what a fantastic way of you know, telling a story. And yeah. that kind of, you know, added to the, you know, in the back of my mind. And then it wasn't until I, yeah, you know, like all writers, I had a, a huge kind of miasma of ideas and things that I wrote, wrote down over, you know, the course of many years and yeah. it wasn't until i kind of really played the, the witcher 3 um you know the computer came on xbox and i just i loved that that gritty slavic sort of teutonic world oh, yeah. well, that's really that's really cool um that's really really cool and i he obviously has magical i mean the magical powers that that would have happened anyway but Geralt of Rivia has some kind of magical powers and i think it was this, the, the, the strap line on the back of my copy of the the game was something like the world doesn't need a hero it needs a professional yeah and I, I yeah and i thought what a great line i loved that line i thought it was so cool and it, that was kind of feeding into the inspiration machine as well and you know i had a, i was reading shard lake which is a kind of a, a series by cj sansom which is about a sort of tudor barrister sort of in, in, the, in the very late um 16th century so you know the time of henry the eighth and all that kind of upheaval so there, there was a little bit of that going in it as well and there was a little bit of um you know, uh, Eisenhorn, which is a kind of like a, he's an inquisitor that Dan Abnett mm-hmm. writes about in the sort of Warhammer 40,000 universe. That was, I'd read those books years before, but that, again, that was always like a, a cool thing. That, so, you know, these kind of things all kind of came together. And one day I was in a place in England called Exmoor, which is kind of like a, you know, I mean, it's very beautiful, strikingly beautiful part of the countryside, but it's, it was a bleak, dreary kind of February, you know, weekend. My wife and I went and, um, I just kind of like, oh, yeah, I'm going to write, a friend of mine was writing a lot of short stories and I thought I'm going to write a short story. And I, I wrote this short story, which was called The Witch of Rill, which obviously is the, the first chapter of yeah. Justice of Kings. And um, it was about this traveling magistrate and he kind of turns up and he, well, it's, it's almost literally word for word, the you know the first couple of chapters of the book. And he kind of deals with this, you know, practice of what is, you know, Dreadism, which is a pagan religion and all the rest of it. And so the book kind of, I got some rejections in it kind of snowballed from there so you know i think the way that my the the way that i kind of pitched it to my agent was um it's a bit of um it's a bit of it's cicero meets um shard lake with the powers of Geralt of rivia and uh, sort of like a medieval judge dread and um and the orbit loved that medieval judge dread they were like oh that's such a nice kind of and they and they used it but i thought i I always kind of regret saying that because the, the point of that was, you know, Judge Dredd is a kind of legal enforcer, but like a very violent and brutal one. Yeah. And uh, and I, I liked the idea of kind of ultimate authority to enforce the law, but I thought actually Justice of Kings is probably a little bit more cerebral than that, a little bit yeah. you know, metho- slower pace and kind of um, co- contemplative. And um, and so, you know, you see in some reviews, people will say, it's not really like Judge Dredd, is it? You know, it's, I'm like, I know I agree. I mean, I, yeah. I don't think it is either, but that was a sort of convenient shorthand. So I think, as I say, those are the kind of, and then, you know, my job, you know, as a litigator, so a lot of the kind of the, the process and procedure, which is not too much, you know, hopefully, but um, that comes from, you know, literally modern English. Yeah. Criminal civil practice, really. <laughs> um, Man, there's, oh, I got it's dark. There we go. <laughs> um, so many. First of all, The Witcher Three is an excellent game, and yes. I'm, I'm I'm so glad that was an influence because when I was reading, yeah. I was like this feels like a lot like The Witcher. Mm, that's also, right. Yeah, yeah. Since you do horrible things in video games, like I shoot or not Rex, did you side with Radovid in Witcher Three? The oh, Mad God, that's King. A, that's an excellent question. I de- so de- did I did shoot Erd not Rex sisters? in the face. I de- so you know what? I'm not actually. I did kill Erdnot and I took great pleasure in it. But I, um, <laughs> I, <laughs> and I would do it again. Um, but I, I, I genuinely finished that game as like ninety percent Paragon or something. Like I, I was fast and loose with his life, but generally I, I don't. I think you have to be a bit of a sociopath to kind of go full renegade in these games. Uh, my second playthrough of Mass Effect is a, is a bit more renegade, but I didn't remember what I did with Radovids. Um, the, I, I. 
I love The Witcher and I played it, but I played it a long time ago now. And oh, I yeah, don't, so. um, I, I did, which one was he? He was the one on the boat in, in Oxenfurt, he's, wasn't he? He's the crazy, he's, yeah, he's the crazy king that's burning all this, all the sorceresses. Right. Well, well t t maybe maybe you know this. At the end of my playthrough, there were religious inquisitors everywhere mm -hmm. in um, what's the big Novigrad? Yeah. Um, and there was yeah, kind of a in, big. He's in Novigrad. Right. Oh, okay. So there was like you know, and they were like burning people and stuff. And I'd I'd obviously allowed that to happen. So maybe I maybe I did let him go. Maybe maybe he had some interesting perspectives to to bring to, to bear. I don't, you know, just give him a fair shake. You're gonna Stop. see you're gonna see sales of your book drop dramatically after this interview. <laughs> Yeah, don't add that. Get, get, get support. Oh, right. yeah. Anyway, um, and, and the Cicero stuff. Uh, I I love. I have realized uh, on my past year in BookTube how much I love this kind of framework uh, yes. of the someone telling the story, someone yeah. who is pr uh, proximal to the events that are happening, but is not yeah, actually yeah. that central character. Um, and I and I know I've mentioned to you this before. Uh, Bernard Cornwell's um, Arthur trilogy yeah. has has the, the the same conceit where I must Arthur, read that. That sounds amazing. Yeah, it, oh, it's fantastic. Arthur's Arthur's one of Arthur's close friends is now a um, a monk in his old age, and he's recounting the real story of Arthur. And um, and I real I'm really enjoying that. And so mm -hmm. I really liked how this did that as well. There was so much like even before I read this, like there was so much. First of all, the fact that mine says no man is above the law, like yep. the idea of fantasy lawyers appeals. I don't think so it's much to me. I don't think it's been done. I, I don't. I mean, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe you know, but I, I, I don't. I haven't read a gigantic amount of fantasy. I used to read a lot more when I was growing up, um, and uh, you know, I read a lot, you know, all the Terry Pratchett and things like that. And um, yes, Discworld. Yeah, yeah. And, Sam uh, Vimes is my hero. Yeah. So, well, you, there's a lot of Sam Vimes in Sir Adamir, I think. Um, you know, <laughs> but but um, the you know, and I read. Um, you know, I'll, I've read the big ones. You know, I read *Name of the Wind* and I read, uh, you know, obviously *Lord of the Rings* and yeah, um, oh, what's uh, *Game of Thrones*. Yeah, I've obviously read that. And things, but a lot of modern fantasy, I've sort of not really dipped my finger. And lots of people, I've seen a lot of comparisons with um, Robin Hobbs. Um, is it *Farseer* trilogy? Which yeah, I, I, have not yet, I have not yet read *Hobbs*. Which I haven't read, but um, you know, it's, apparently it's the same narrative device where you've got an old, an older person, you know, recounting oh, okay. the events of these. And I, I love that narrative device, and I thought it worked so well in the *Cicero* trilogy, which I'm obviously most swear I've taken it from wholesale. But the, um, you know, and it's one of those things. Some people won't like it. You know, some people will say, "I oh, will." It kind of, you know, robs the the book of its tension because we know that Helena survives, and you know, blah blah blah. I think it's a very powerful storytelling technique because you you just impregnate the narrative with you know foreshadowing and dramatic irony yeah. and you know you can say things like oh well if, if only we'd known we would have never you know we would never have done it that way and sometimes it's I a bit cheap that. yeah yeah no I love it as well you know and it can be like a bit of a you know a bit cheap as I say like a bit cliffhangery at times but you know if you use it kind of in a nuanced way and you sort of sprinkle it through so I I think it's a tremendously effective storytelling tool um, oh, yeah. From and, the first you, chapter, when she's like, you know, it was at the the village of Rel that everything that everything started to go wrong. Shit. No. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. That was this is where the empire collapsed. And so, I think you know how done it and who done it are as equally intriguing storytelling devices. Like we know the Soviet Empire collapses, right? But we don't know exactly how that happens. Yeah. Um, and so. I really like it as a storytelling device. Um, and yeah, as I say, you you just every chapter is like yeah the end is just like well we definitely wouldn't have done that if we you know, or with von, von der Bell was actually 100 percent incorrect to have done this and here are the reasons why and yeah. so it just keeps people to, to turning the pages so yeah, oh, yeah. I, I like I, I love i oh my gosh i have like i have <laughs> fallen in love with that narrative device um over mm. over the last couple of years in addition i love traveling magistrates yes, which are not do. done nearly enough they're not i don't know why like there's so much there's just so much to do with traveling right. magistrates and one of the only other series i've read is um sebastian de castell's great coats but it is much yes. more of a it's much more of a musketeer swashbuckling there's, there's many more sword fights in right. that than, than yeah, there yeah. is actually ma magistrating courts and that's one of the <laughs> things i like about this is that von mm. Bolt, we see like we see the uh not just the duels because those are there but we mm, also yeah. see the actual administration of the law and von yes. Volt's interpretation of how harsh he's going to apply the law. Yeah, yeah. And we get another thing that is common to magistrates that Greatcoats has as well, 
speeches. I yeah. love speeches in books. <laughs> like I'm oratory. Fan. Yes. Well, Act. Cicero was an orator, wasn't he? Go on, yes. Alan, have you? Raymond yeah. oratory. Uh, 100%. <laughs> and so some of the speeches given and then seeing like how much Helena thinks his job is boring. Like I know. <laughs> she thinks teenagers. it's so boring. <laughs> I think exactly right. And I, I, I think with with von, what I wanted to do with the book was kind of, uh, you know, and, and history will judge this, but so, you, you want to see a little, I wanted to inject a little a bit of verisimilitude to the, to the story. So like, I wanted to think about like things like how does von Vault, if you have a, a sort of a common law system, which is a system that kind of evolves as judgments are given. So you have a framework of law, but it, it changes over time and you have the same system in the States as we do in, the, in England. Um, you know, how, how does that, how does that, what are the, the physics of that? Like, you know, Von Volk passes a judgment in a village that's like 500 miles away from Sover or a thousand miles away from Sover. Because, and this was another thing I, uh, we were just chatting about before this call, um, was when I was reading the Cicero again, and, uh, and Julius Caesar, he goes off into Gaul for eight years, as you corrected me, rather than four. Um, but, uh, and I was thinking, what, what, are, what are the logistics of the empire? Like, how is it all how is it still Roman? You have like a, a gigantic, you know, ge geographic area. And if the, if one day, like, you know, the, the ruler of that empire, like just goes away on, a, on campaigning for, you know, best part of a decade, it's like, how do things, how do the wheels keep turning? And so the logistics of kind of like a, a late antiquity, you know, empire kind of really interested me. And so, you know, we have like in, in the Soviet Empire, we have the Imperial Relay, which is kind of like a kind of medieval Pony Express. And yes. so you can kind of, you, you send the judgments back and then you kind of get your stipend from the kind of central government. So, you know, there's kind of there's a bureau, bureaucratic element to it as well. And, you know, how, how this kind of system is maintained and, you know, how these kind of justices are trained to be kind of very important. Because one thing I, my legal training um, and people, you know, there's loads of jokes about lawyers being you know, crooked and corrupt and all the rest of it. Um, it's certainly in England, at least, nothing could be further from the truth. Like the, the ethics and like the rigor in which you are you know, schooled and trained is like to the nth degree. And, and both I've worked for two different law firms and, you know, both times, at any time there was any sense of impropriety, you know, there was, we had like anti-money laundering officers and, and a whole kind of framework wow. to deal with these things. And, and it was very, very rigorous. And so, you know, I wanted to kind of get that aspect of it across as well. You know, Von Vault is, is ultimately a, a stickler, you know, for, for the rules. But I think there's also for Von Vault, there's a, there's a cowardice in that as well. And I think, you know, he's, he's like, well, this is, this is what the law says. So, so I'm, I'm allowing myself to be bound by that, you know, and, and it, it, yeah. it's, there's, as I said, it was almost like a slight, you're hiding behind the lesser of the law. Mm -hmm. And we kind of explore that a bit more as, a, as the trilogy goes on. Um, and, uh, and a lot of that is to do with his childhood and how he, you know, he went to war and all the rest of it. Um, and so I think, you know, I wanted to just, just little tidbits here and there, like where Helen is like, oh, well, I, you know, I know how much Von Volt is, is paid because I'm his clerk, you know, or yeah. Yeah, I think Brest, have an argument with Bresting, and he's like, you know, you have no idea how expensive it is to be a you know, magistrate. You know, if you think about it, you're traveling from city to city and you've got to you pay for stabling and your lodgings and every meal you eat, you, it's all being paid for, right? And and, she, and he's like, you have no idea how expensive it is. And she's like, well, I, I, I do know how expensive it is because I'm his clerk. Like, <laughs> it's literally my job to know how expensive. And so just little things like that where we think we're, we're kind of looking behind the, you know, the kind of the veil of, oh, you know, I'm going to chop your head off because you're a bad guy. Um, yeah. And actually just the the day to day, you know, admin that goes into being like yeah. a traveling administrator of the law, which sounds extremely dry when I talk about it like that. But I'm, I mean, I'm hoping we've kind of struck a nice balance in the novel. Yeah. It, and, and, and you do. And it does it, like that's the thing is trying to convey to people like what's different about books like this that yes. deal with. I have become more and more fascinated with fantasy slash ancient uh, administrative systems, uh, yeah. bureaucracies, and yeah. economies. Because yeah. it, I don't, I, I don't know. They're they're fascinating to me. But when you talk about those things, because there's people like like Daniel Abraham who explore that. KJ Parker loves mm. fantasy economies, um, like yeah. banking and stuff. Oh, and it's hard. To, it's hard to just to to say no, no, no. It's not boring. Like yeah. it's fascinating because it's yeah, not yeah. done a lot. So no. I love the fact that we get to see. What goes into nuts and bolts? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, it's, like, it's. I have to tell my students when we talk about armies and mm. there's, you know, generals on campaign. They think 
a general summons an army in a day, marches out, punches the enemy in the face, goes back. It's like, do y'all yeah, yeah. know what goes into <laughs> like <laughs> I don't know how much money goes into this? <laughs> seriously, do you know how many wagons and wives and children and yeah, merchants yeah. and prostitutes and like ten times the size of the army itself, like just following it in miles long baggage out there for months yeah. fighting a single battle. Like it's not yeah. like it's they didn't do it in the afternoon. No. It's, but it's 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 so interesting things. No, and and you're absolutely right. And I I remember like thinking, you know, when I was younger, and you think of like your sort of classic medieval battle, you know, sort of like I don't know, 14th century England, for example. And you go you go you go like five thousand guys on one side. In my head, when I was younger, these battles were like twenty thousand, thirty thousand guys. You know, like and and then I remember in Game of Thrones, and one of the, my early frustrations with Game of Thrones was like. These battles are tiny, you know, they're like, you know, 5,000. But I was thinking, no, that's actually absolutely on the money. Like, you just can't, th there's not the population size. There's a brilliant, there's a brilliant article, I think I read it years ago on the internet. God knows where it is now. And it was like about, it was about fantasy world building or like the fantasy, the million man march, I think it was called, you know, and it was like the fantasy army, like, and it was like, take a population, and they used medieval France as mm. an analog. And they said, right, medieval France had a population of, I don't know, 10 million people or something, I mean, tiny. Um, 10 million people. And X number of those, right, so first of all, all the take all of the women, you know, they're up. So 50% of the population, right, of the remaining, like, take out all the old, take out all the people who are too young, take out all the people who are doing, like, the, the jobs are too important, you yeah. know, so, like, your masons and your, your apothecaries and whatever. Take, the, take out all of, like, the people who are ill, take out all of, like, your, your, your policemen, you know, your constabulary, your, your city war, you know, and you're left with, like, uh, you, here are 5,000 men you can scratch together. And also, by the way, they've all got to go home and till the fields uh, in, you know, in the awesome. So you've really only got a kind of three month window. And when you really drill down into the logistics of, you know, fighting at this time and the cost of like arming all these, feeding these people, like where do they, where do they go to the toilet? You know, all this kind of stuff, but, you know, the logistics are, are fascinating. And yeah. um, my students are always shocked because the Romans ruin it for everybody because they really did yeah. have huge battles, you know, like 80,000 yeah. people. Yeah, but right. My, my Latin students, they, they learn this. And then we go into Greek history and then we're talking about a huge battle involving the Greeks and there's like 6,000 men. On yeah, like side. Macedonians or something. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And it's just like, <laughs> really? 6,000? Like how? Yeah. Like, oh, they right. lost 300 men. It's like, so? Like, <laughs> The Romans lost 80,000 at Canai. The it's Canai, like, yeah, yeah, I was going to say, yeah. But it's it's just like most, exactly as you say, most battles were these small scale yeah. uh, um, skirmishes endeavors. almost. Yeah, and I, I remember I was listening to uh, Dan Carlin's Hardcore History podcast and he was talking about... Um, is I, I I I went on a, a huge sort of Second World War like nonfiction phase the last you know year or two. I was reading loads about it. I got really down into it, and uh, I was listening to his podcast as well. And he was talking about the Pacific Theater, and just the, they were just like yeah, the battles they were awful, you know, Peleliu and you know Okinawa and all the rest of it. But he was like that just like he said logistics win wars like he's, he's american generals he's got great american generals and they were like it's the logistics that you've got you've constantly got the battles will you know they will win themselves almost but it's the, the getting of the these island hopping through thousands of miles of ocean and the, the baggage trains and all the rest of it i mean and i remember you know nazi germany i think it was something like if the allies had carried on just carpet bombing um like oil refineries yeah. in like 43 yeah. that they would have won the war in like three months they stopped doing it because they thought it wasn't doing anything yeah. but like you know they were gonna the nazis were gonna run out of petrol basically for yeah. you yeah. know for and it's these kind of you know this kind of backroom stuff which i think yeah. is readers will probably disagree I, but I, I think it's way more interesting i agree i've, I've taught my kids to be a little that many ancient generals they know mm. attack the supply lines you yeah. attack the, you you hit you, the baggage you, train you, you go over to the Hellespont region and you blockade yep. it so that Athens can't get its grain from the Black Sea. That's what you yep. do. Go shut yeah. it off and Athens get will be like... Phoenician Navy. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> so, <laughs> Justice of Kings. <laughs> sorry, yeah. So you might want to edit all of that out. <laughs> oh, oh, my. This, this, this is why this interview will be different from yes. uh, the innumerable amounts, I'm sure. He hear us talk about the battles of late antiquity and about five minutes on the novel that you've got coming out. <laughs> Logistics, like I think that administrative stuff is not, I don't think we think about that enough when we're reading like, when we're reading I don't think so either. our fantasy books. But I do want to talk about the fact that 
Um, I didn't know. Like when I first started reading the book, I figured it out in the first chapter, obviously. And I have heard other people. They were mm. they're not aware that the book is told from no. Helena's perspective and not Von Vault's. I think that's awesome. Like you said, <laughs> um, yeah. you said in, when we talked before about keeping it like from the great man, like not from the great man's perspective. Exactly. Like, yeah. How yeah. Could, right. Like how could you make Cicero your main character? Right. Like. Right. So I've, I've always, I've always, whenever I read, you know, books about like, you know, Hilary, Hilary Mantel and she did, um, oh, what was it? Wolf, Wolf Hall. Hall. Wolf Hall. Yeah. And it, and it was like a, and it, again, I thought that was going to be, it was, I think it was Thomas Cromwell, was, she wrote it from a perspective of, and I, I always get like really jittery of thinking about like taking such kind of important historic, I mean, the obviously a real historical character. Um, so how do you even begin to kind of, it's such a gigantic undertaking when you think about these people who have such storied, I mean, it'd be, it would be like writing a novel about from Churchill's perspective or like, you know, F, you know, the FDR's perspective, like yeah. you, you, you wouldn't take it on. Like it's, it's such a huge undertaking. And I, and I think, um, you know, and so I think it's, but, but at the same time, I think it would also be disappointing. I think Von Volt is obviously a completely fictional character, but he is, he is supposed to be, as you say, this kind of great man of history, um, you know, within the Soviet empire, he is, he is the Cicero. He is the kind of this yeah. patrician of, you know, this great kind of states, elder statesman of, of the Soviet empire. And, um, and I think you, you lose so much if you tell it from his perspective, because, you know, all of his thoughts and feelings, you know, with Helena, we can we can guess at it, and we can see how his actions affect her and affect the people around them with a much more kind of truthful and honest lens. And so she and she can criticize von Volt. So if von Volt was telling the story, he'd be like, "And then I had a six pack, and I yeah, and I yeah, killed like ten guys." Justifiably did this. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And I knew that this was the correct thing to do for these reasons. And so, you know, you remove, you you can see that the history of it through a sort of a, a more critical eye. And and so I, I think that um, was, a, was for me, definitely the right narrative choice. And I think it makes the narrative much more interesting and it, it maintains a lot of, you know, von, von Volt is supposed to be this kind of like quite unscrutable character. Like he's, he's a serious man. Um, you know, he's, he's got a, a huge kind of weight on his shoulders. He, he had this kind of horrible, you know, when he was 15, he got sent to war and he was campaigning for the empire for kind of two or three years. And so he's seen some like horrible things. And so he's, he's quite quiet about it. And and he's just he's just kind of interested in now in kind of administrating the law, kind of touring the hinterlands, you know, maintaining his kind of hermitage and, um, and, and sort of doing all that. And I think just to see the story told from him would rob the reader of of so much you know interesting dynamics like character dynamics and i think you know and helena she knows his character in herself right and it's it's not if it's not just about you know von vault it's about the people around him as well and and i think um you know helena i you know, she's she was a really fun and an interesting character to write and she's obviously as as you've you know pointed out she's like that an awkward time in her life she's, she's not an adolescent but she's not like a mature you know woman yet and so she acts like a, a teenager you know and she's she's like a kind of mercurial you know oh, this is boring you know like fucking hell you know, it's, you know some of the most interesting work that's available in the empire and she's like this is really dull and so she doesn't really like it but you know the flip side it's it's a life of kind of wealth and privilege and yeah okay so this, she's stuck in these kind of patriarchal hinterlands but you know Bressinger is like yeah but wait till we get to Sova you know the Sova's got, Sova is the, the, the Rome of the ancient world yeah. you know it's 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 a melting pot of cultures creeds you know the women there they can do anything they're just as equal as the men and you know it's not like it is in the provinces you know just wait a year until we get back there and you'll see kind of thing yeah. and so she's very temperamental and she's obviously had a horrible upbringing herself as well and I think as you've identified one of the themes as well that I've explored um, in the novel is one von Volt who's this, who acts as like a kind of a beacon of consistency yeah. for all of the people around him, Elena included, but also Bressinger. Um, you know, when he kind of is got, starts to get a bit out of his depth, um, so the mood of his retainers starts to kind of shift and and become yeah. more you know mercurial as well. And I and so it was about kind of working that theme through the narrative so yeah, people read this book and be like everybody's just miserable in this novel um <laughs> which you know to be thought which they are right i mean yeah. but um you know it's because 
I'm not interested in telling the story when everything was fine. Yeah. Um, you know, because that's you know it's not as interesting. We we are talking about the collapse of an empire and all of the kind of, the, I mean, to take a line from the book, the death and devastation that goes with that. And yeah. um, and so it is a kind of very testing time for the character. I don't think it's worse. You know, book two is it's yeah. getting worse for them. Uh, you know, this is not like a happy story. Yeah. Um, and so I thought that, you know, I think that, I think the fact that people are surprised by it is probably more of a not a failure of marketing, but certainly, do, because ultimately this is a sto- this is the story of Sir Conrad von Vogt. Yeah. You know, to my and that's it, this is his story. It's just someone else telling it, mm-hmm. and so and and because someone else is telling it, we get all of their insights and you know things that go with it as well. And so, okay. people hoping for kind of like a I am the law, you know, yeah. blah, stab in the neck kind of thing. I think they'll be disappointed, but 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 hoping that it's nonetheless a, a kind of a more visceral and cerebral reading experience. Yeah, from this way. Um, I, I agree. And, and even though, even though they're in like, like Von, Von was in a bad mood, like almost the entire book, like he is yeah. grouchy, like, yes. and understandably he is, he is like a pillar of the old system. And yeah. He right. Is, he, re, he is starting to realize that no one cares. Like, yeah. like, like the world is moving on Von Vault. Mm. You are a relic almost yeah. at this point, but it never feels, it never feels grim. And I think that's another stroke of genius from Helena's point of view, because teenagers, every, like I teach them, everything's a crisis. They yeah. feel oh everything God. large, but they're also capable of such great like joy and optimism. Yeah. So seeing it from Helena's perspective, even though like if it was Von Vault, yeah, it would probably be gloom and doom. Oh my like, God. Like yeah. everything. <laughs> but it still feels like hopeful and kind of upbeat, even mm. though, you know, yeah. everyone's miserable. Because yeah. it's from Helena's perspective, so right. I thought that was that was uh, that was really good. Also, oh, thank you. Yeah, I think um, you know, and I think uh, as a, as a, I've seen some reviews where people have been like, you know, this is this is grim dark fiction, and I, I, I mean, I don't really know what the definition of grim dark is because you know when I was reading you know, black library fiction back in the day, that was yeah. grim dark. The one of forty thousand universe where everything is kind yeah. of dolled up to eleven. That's <laughs> well, I think that actually where, you know, <laughs> that's where it's kind of that's where the the phrase came from. Uh, to my mind, grim dark fiction is is fiction in which the author just delights in being really bleak um, and you know just constantly pulling the rug un- from under the reader in terms of all, you know, awfulness. Um, and there's all kinds of just you know, there's just no hope. And uh, this is not that book. Yeah. I don't. I mean, I don't think. You know, we know for, for one, we know Helena lives, right? So how bad can it be? But, <laughs> um, but I, I think when you read this book, and we'll come on to this in the spoiler section of this video, yeah. but I wanted there to be some comeuppance. You know, I didn't. I didn't want it just to be a. This is a, this is a story of of as you've just identified, right? This is a story of bureaucratic slowness to adapt to like modernizing and and threat yes. uh, th- modern threats so and we've seen it in the real world in the last you know mm-hmm. the complacency of western democracies you know that, that that kind of like oh he's he's just an insane you know swivel-eyed loon you know we, we can we can afford to ignore this person ridicule them you know and, and then actually but the, but these people they they seem to actually have their finger on the pulse of you know general feeling and public uh, the, the quiet majority and that's and I, happened time and again through history of course there's nothing there's nothing new in that yeah. right and i and i think this was a novel about you know von vault becoming increasingly obstinate about the um you know the primacy of the common law and 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 actually being quite a little bit blind and willfully blind to the fact that the world is is actually at the mercy of you know bad faith actors mm-hmm. you know and it doesn't take that much to, to kind of upset the balance um and you know that's i was a you know to, to do a sort of deep dive into these themes I, I i was a um i was like 12 or 13 i think when 9 11 happened and you know for the subsequent decade at least um you know the headlines are all about global war on terror and all of the, yeah. the things that went with that and so and that really influenced my writing and, and my um at my university, I, you know, I did modules on like the law and ethics of warfare. I did counterterrorism, you know, public international law, all these kind of like fascinating areas of, you know, this, this corpus of like in, in legal systems and how they deal with these these threats. Yeah. Um, and, the, and the classic question of counterterrorism, my first question was like, 
you have a you have a guy who's got this ticking time bomb and he knows the code and is it you know ethically and morally can we kill him or torture him to get the information out of to defuse the bomb and it's just it's the classic kind of consequentialist yeah. versus deontologist you know ethical argument does the end justify the means if you want to kind of reduce it down and um and, and so again these these themes of what happens when you have an empire the Soviet empire is is you know, I make no bones about it. They've they've expanded through bloody conquests. It's, it is an empire that exists as as an end as an end in itself. Von Vault's um, country was was conquered, right? Von Vault's yeah, country, right? So. Jagland, yeah, yeah. And he and he was so his father, Von Vault's father, did what's called taking the high mark. So he he basically, much like the Achaemenid Persians did, they moved in. As you, I don't need to tell you this, but they moved into they an area. Eyes. They let them meet eyes. Right, exactly. You know, they just you, you now worship your temples now are our temples. You know, your bureaucracy is now our bureaucracy, but everything else can say the same. You know, yeah. you just do what you want, and we'll leave you alone. Uh, you, and you just pay taxes to us now, and that's kind of like the Soven way as well. And those that didn't comply were, were killed. Yeah, um, and so von Volt's father did that. He did. He he accepted a bribe. I'm a Soven now. Um, you know, you are now a Soven. Yeah. And so and so von Volt be became a Soven essentially, but he was pressed into the legions. And so he then killed a bunch of his countrymen who wouldn't submit, and then a whole bunch of other people besides. And so, you know, he he has that kind of the zeal of the con. He has he has to believe now that the Soviet Empire was the right because if he doesn't, if he thinks oh, actually this is the wrong thing to have done, um, his whole worldview collapses. Yeah. Um, and that's that really at, what's at the core of von Volt, and that's why he wears the common law as a cloak because it's a comfort. It's like well, the Soviet Empire did some dreadful things, but they've they've civilized all these other countries, yeah. and I am an agent of that civilization. And I think, you know, once you, you and so the Soviet Empire is kind of painted as this, OK, yeah, it did like really bad things. I'm not going to gloss over that. But at the same time, the common law is an objectively a good yeah. thing. Right. And in theory, at least everybody is subject to it. So that is something that is worth maintaining. And it's this huge kind of bureaucratic institution. And von Volt, um will go to great lengths to maintain that bureaucratic institution. But like. You know, we just have in the book, we have these guys, you know, we have Claver, who's like, well, actually, I, I think it was better when we had the church running things, you know. We'll, we'll get to, we'll get to yeah. Claver. Oh, <laughs> and so it, we we see that it's a, it's a, it's a, the themes of, kind of justice and, and ethics of the law, but also it's another huge theme in this and, and has been in my writing is, you know, what, what do you do as a kind of supposedly liberal tolerant you know secular society when you are faced with existential threats and more often than not we've seen the answer is well hope ignore it and hope it goes away uh, <laughs> and of course it doesn't um and so that yeah that's another i, can't, I have no idea what your original question was that's but. fine intentional or not <laughs> that um von Volt's slow like obstinate like refusal to accept the changing of bureaucracy yes even more like cicero that's what that's what puts cicero out at the at the turn of the republic exactly. that's why yeah. he was you know shunted off by antony and augustus because he didn't modernize he didn't you know, adapt he, improvise he was, adapt overcome he was determined he believed in the core of the republic and that he yeah. just people would just understand and eventually mm. go back to you know the yeah, virtue yeah. of rome and no one was interested sorry cicero. it's like the who was it the not the prelates the um was the con was the who represented the, the plebeians? Was the consul? The, tri the tribunes. The, the tribunes. tribunes. That was it. And it, you had the tribunes for like centuries, and every and, and then and then one day they were like, oh, actually, we can just bribe them, you know, or, yes. or we, can, we can we can murder them. You, you, um, well, you couldn't kill them, and so for a while they're like, well, we'll just pay them, and then yeah. and then in like 109 with Tiberius Gracchus, they murder him. Nothing happens, and they're that's, like, oh, yeah, that's. I guess yeah. we can just kill them and nothing. Oh, we'll just... We see that. Oh my gosh, this is one of my hot button issues, Richard. We see this all the time. <laughs> like, and that's another theme in like, that's, I love this theme in the book. It's like, okay, that's against yeah. the law. Who's going to, who's going to, what are you going to do about it? Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's, it's, in, it might in, is right. You know, yeah. That, that's, the it's theme in, this, in, in American history, Andrew Jackson was going to take an army to go do something that was, he wasn't allowed to do. And the Supreme hmm. Court, the, Chief Justice Supreme Court said, you can't. And he mm. said, well, I have the army. So if John, I think it's if John Jay wants to stop me, like, yeah. let, let him fight me. And he went and did it anyway. Like, yeah, yeah. And, yeah, and, yeah. and nothing. And you will see, you know, this is a, this is a whole different conversation. But yeah, we, we saw it in the annexation of, of the Crimea Peninsula, like, you know, four or five years ago. Nothing happened. You know, yeah. There were sanctions, sure. But I mean, they just yeah. kind of, they just did it. And I think that was like a real wake up call for, you know, NATO and the West when they realized, 
we're so frightened of push. I mean, Russia is the ultimate paper tiger, right? I mean, you can actually drill down into their economy and their army and stuff. It's it's all kind of a house of cards. Um, and they've this, done an excellent. This, uh, this this video is now blocked. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think the book is getting a Russian publication as well, so I should yeah. probably rein this no, in. No one but, will see this video. <laughs> but, but we're getting into the interesting themes, which is the important thing. Yes, but, I, I, I agree with you. But I think, but just okay, I'll put a pin in that. But I think the the point it's is, is that, I, I I get what you're saying, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I, I I think, and people never thought it would happen. Yeah, you know, this is you know the the turn of the this is 2015 or whatever it was. You know, this this is like 1940s, sure. You know, or not now, but actually it does, and and I and it can, and I think. Um, you know that was a kind of and so again i just wanted to ca capture that yeah that feeling of if you if you are brazen enough which is something i've experienced as a litigator a dozen yeah. times you you'll get away with it you know if yeah. it's if it is too expensive or like administratively painful administratively painful to do something about it that people won't um and that's fascinating for me first of all i love these conversations because my degree is in international politics so oh, right there you go about geopolitical stuff <laughs> yeah. but i love these kind of themes that are being explored mm. and so this book is so good and moving back real quick to helena i yes. and other people that i've seen i think you write this teenage female like really <laughs> well and you. you know you see a lot in, in fantasy like there's a lot of complaint about men Writing the way women. men write women mm, and i agree as a teacher of teenagers mm. She absolutely feels like one of my uh, one of my seniors just graduated, like first year in college, doesn't really know what like who, yeah, yeah. who she is, like what she wants mm. to do, is petulant yeah. at times, but also quite bright and resourceful. Yep. When like it's, I think she's just really good, and I'm I'm not the only one that feels this way. So, oh, thanks. No, I think it's you know it's. The key, I think I approached it from the from the sense of you know this is the first time I've, when I've written a novel I've really kind of drilled into my characters' histories and and thought about how those histories will affect them as, as adults or you know where they are in, in their lives at the moment and I think you know Helena is she's had this fairly traumatic up, upbringing in terms of you know her parents were killed and she was an orphan in Moldau um, and so she, that would make her quite you know, quite a resourceful and, and sort of outwardly thick-skinned character but actually you know behind that facade you're going to have someone who's incredibly temperamental and with very little kind of self-esteem really needs something or someone to kind of latch on to which is what she does with von volts and so von volt provides this you know as i say this this continue this pillar of stability in her life and then so she does it for a couple of years but actually she's like tina as, you, as you've already identified tina's is they're very adaptable and i think um you know so she adapts to that very quickly you know the traveling around to the point at which she feels comfortable enough to say well actually you know, this is a bit boring now you know <laughs> I've, I've almost forgotten about not quite but you know it still forms part of my character but and we're, now we're doing this and i now i've kind of got used to that and, and i i think she she's a stroppy you know she's a stroppy teenager right yeah. i mean teenagers just are quite mercurial but but i think it, it was about using the kind of the von vault and the kind of the dressing as, as a canvas to to reflect her emotions you know back at, you know she falls in she fancy just like he's a good looking guy Mattis is the same age he's, he's a guy's got armor and sword and he's like he seems pretty cool and she kind of just like people don't really like the room I think the biggest criticism has been the romance but I actually think it's not my place to disagree with people but like I, I, I thought it was it, I will do it for you Richard because I <laughs> teach teenagers Right. They are in love after three days. Honestly, yeah, like the, you, the, the emotions that they feel, the the rampant, like it's you definitely can fall head over heels for someone in a couple of days. I've I've done it. You know? they'll, they'll mourn for a week after a relationship yeah. that was five days. I loved him. He was gonna get. We were gonna get married. Yeah, you know, you've known that person five days. What are you? I have some perspective. <laughs> <laughs> I was, but I was the same. I was a teenager. I remember you know, we were all teenagers once, right? I remember like you know being in a two-month relationship, and then it like completely emotionally wiped me out, and then it ended. Not, it's not I wanted, didn't want to end it. Yeah. And it's the end of the world, right? And everything's and so, the end of the world for teenagers. Yeah, and I, I, I think there's sort of the the abruptness of that, and and the the I actually in my to my mind, I mean, I wrote the book, so I obviously think this, but you know, to my mind, I thought that was a fairly accurate portrayal of a teenage, you know, tryst. You know, she. 
and, and you you have to remember as well with Helena, there's an there's an urgency to her life because they're only ever in one place for a couple. Of, if there's nothing to do, if they get sent to a village, like you know, everything is great. They just go. They just, they'll stay the night and then they'll leave. So, you know, for her, everything has an immediacy to it. You know, well, I need to kind of get my skates on with this because we might be on the road in a minute and I need to decide whether I want to stay here forever or if I want to carry on with Von Vault. So I thought in the in the context of the novel and her life, I mean, people, the thing is, you can't expect people to kind of drill into these issues as much as you, the author, you know, did when you were thinking about it. That's yeah. that's never going to be possible. We, we don't like to write our own reviews. But I, I feel like the... The, the Roma, well, a lot of people didn't like the, the Roma, they thought it was too quick, but I was like, I don't think, it, I mean, I don't think it is. I think it's pretty emblematic of a typical kind of teenage relationship. I'm, and, I'm, I'm with you. Yeah. Oh, thanks, Alan. <laughs> the, the check is in the mail, by the way. I think it's so. just, I think it's just a, a, a typical fantasy thing where this happens, it happens quickly a lot. Like that's a, that's a, uh, a typical, like, Thing well, it's that fiction thing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's you know, it's and one of my biggest gripes in fiction, which is kind of like a, a bit of an anal kind of gripe. It doesn't shouldn't really matter in the scheme of yeah. things because I'm a great I'm a great believer in dramatic license, but I often find that novels, genre novels, they they, they take place over too short a space of time, and I, you know, you'll have like, well, I won't give an example, but the the um, I so I was at pains in the empire of the wolf to, to make it seem like yes the empire is collapsing but it, the, the narrative the trilogy takes place over months you know it's, yeah. it's almost like a year or something and you know when you look at the the, the the dissolution of the roman empire it wasn't like a right there's no roman empire anymore it was a slow succumbing to um you know barbarianization you know of the different I mean, <laughs> I and, and uh, the praetorian guards <laughs> the praetorian guards killed emperors before they had time to fix anything. No yes. one could get any kind of stability on anything because they're murdering, like yeah. they're changing emperors every one, like months, one year, two years maximum. Yeah. You they weren't paying them enough in bribe money. Because you're trying to patch the holes on the edge of this enormous, like superstructure. Yeah. I mean, it had just become too big by the end, yeah, hadn't it? Like yeah. with with ugh, we're getting back into late antiquity with, with the medieval yeah. logistics. Of, uh, yeah. Yeah, let's move on. <laughs> um, but so, uh, but most uh, most people, this is getting a lot of positive feedback. I've like most yeah. people are really enjoying the book. Absolutely, they absolutely are. Yeah, and it's it is it obviously is you know it's, it's truly wonderful. And I think um, I think I think it's just. So, it's it's not something that's been done before, or certainly not like this. Um, yeah. You know, it's it's a kind of it, it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a murder mystery ultimately. You know, it, it, which, which I is love. It is. Yeah, I, I think I mean, we all, everybody loves a murder mystery at the end of the day. Like, and and it's telling that that forms like probably about sixty percent of all fiction that's published is some kind of murder mystery. <laughs> I didn't I didn't even know the you know, the secret history by Donna Tart. Yeah. I didn't I didn't know that was a murder mystery, but but it is. Um, oh and that's a fantastic book. But um, so yeah, it's getting great feedback. And my I was talking to the guys at Phantology yesterday, and I was saying my only concern is you know it's gone out to kind of like, tame reviewers is the wrong word because there's been you know, a few negative reviews, but like reviewers who ha are more interested and invested in giving the book a kind of a, kind of like a fair shake but um it hasn't you know, gone to as, the rabid masses yet it hasn't gone to the the, the, the proletariat yet <laughs> who have no interest in like the my feelings bread. yeah it's exactly bread for the masses you know and, <laughs> oh and they That's you'll true. get people yeah and they i mean i've I've read books i've hated books you know it's it's very easy to leave you know negative reviews and i think once it goes out to those people who you know they don't know me from adam right and i and i think uh you know once you get the more unguarded this was shit you know i hated everything about this novel that's gonna then it's gonna be time to close the laptop lid i think and just take a step yeah. away from it all yeah i and i i can like i can't imagine how i don't know like the how that would play on people's mental health like looking like this guy is an idiot and doesn't yeah. know and his book is trash yeah like, uh, it doesn't explore these things. and i think we live in a world now where you know creators of of you know consumable content um are are exposed to a huge breadth of direct in, uh, feedback in, in a way that you would never have been able to you know even 10 20 years ago um and it's just it's not healthy for the mind um, yeah. but uh, but your brain your brain craves to look at it as well it's addictive to, to look at yeah. it and to read it but it's also 100%. bad for you yeah. well, it's a social media in a nutshell isn't it yeah. um 
Oh, you go on. Oh, sorry. We, we talked about you said how awkward it it's going to be if I hate book two between Extremely. you. Extremely. It's gonna we're not going to be doing this video, are we? <laughs> it was so, so awkward. Because, well, I love this book right out of the gate, like because I was supposed to like Angela had asked me if I wanted to do the their little orbit uh, publicity thing, and yes. I was like, yes, but I need to read at least part of the book because I don't want to be disingenuous and be no, like, sure. I hate this. Mm. Let me pretend like I don't. But yeah. I read the first chapter and I was like, guess I'm finishing this book. And nice. I read it in like three days and I loved it. And I was like, I was, I was an excellent choice for this, Angela. Thank you. You were. I no, I, this book. So I, I think the that. danger is, you know, when you have a, when you have a book like this, it's, it's part of a trilogy or a series. Um, you, you, what people tend to want is, is more of the same. Um, and you know, book two is di is different you know it's it's oh. we, we we go we're in sova for a bit we'll go to the frontier for a bit and it's it's the scope is is broadening and we're yeah. more into those kind of the, the fighting and the political machinations there so i think what, what my original like vision for this like years ago was to have like almost like dresden files but with von volheiner and bressinger and they, you'd have like 10 books and every book would yeah. be like a different crime um but i thought that the the way I ended up writing it, which is kind of with a heavy character focus, I thought there's probably only two or three books I can really sustain this for and keep it interesting and fresh. And so that's the kind of, and I thought it, the much tighter narrative arc served it. But you know, the, the if you if you go into book, and book two has, well, I mean, I haven't got my edits back yet, so this might change. But book two um, is, I thought, I, I still want to retain the core of book one because yeah. that's what makes this trilogy unique. So I still want to have like an investigation. Because the way I kind of write is every book needs an arc that is completely closed off and finished. And then you need a broader arc mm -hmm. across all three so that each book is a satisfying reading experience in and of itself. And so I wanted to maintain the the investigative you know, mis mis mystery aspect in, in book two and you were the new crime. But this time it's a, it's a, a crime of states rather than yeah. a, you know, a local crime. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Um, so hopefully you like it, but if you don't, that's, that's absolutely fine. But we'll just have a I mean, you're gonna you're gonna have people who <laughs> you're gonna have people who hate that the there's an investigation again, and then you're gonna mm. have people who love it, and like there's yeah. gonna be people who are mad that you did the, that you did something similar, and then there's gonna be people that that are gonna be mad that you didn't do something similar. Exactly. I think you've just no you've winning. just got to write you've just got to write the story you want to tell, yeah. and I and I you know I do read reviews. I, I'm going to stop soon because it's you know it's after. Um, yeah. yeah, I'm not. There's that's only so much. You... <laughs> After it's out in the public, I'm, that's it. I'm turning it off. But like, I do read the reviewers' reviews because often they, yeah, you know, they, they, they do. They make efforts to kind of drill into the themes, and and ultimately, that's the most satisfying thing as a writer is when people really engage with the message you're trying to yeah. put out there. But I think, um, you know, I, you, I'll read literally two reviews, and one will say. I, I thought the world building was really weak. There was almost nothing here. You know, this could have had much more information. And then the next review would be like, I loved the intricate, detailed world building. And it's like, I'm, I'm learning nothing from this. You know, yeah. this, you know, everybody's approaching it from their own lens. Yeah. And so, you know, as I say, all you can do is just write the books that you want to write and that you would, would want to read yeah. and hope that people, you know, ultimately like it. Or, well, or certainly more people like it than didn't. I will forward you any one star reviews that are because you shot or not Rex in the face. <laughs> I did have one. I had one one star review that was like the pri the price went up. I was like, what's <laughs> <that?"> <laughs> I was like, well, this not my fault. <laughs> it is. If Amazon damages your book, yeah. your book is getting is getting like honestly, it's I so, flabbergasted with um with this because we're about we're about to go into spoiler section, but yes. How similar to your first draft is this book? Like, did you have to go through a bunch of editing? Like, I know, but but yeah, yeah, it's 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 extremely similar. Uh, is the short answer. Um, the awesome. the the journey from first draft to final draft is it was a short one. I think um, the the I say that now I'm going to say something that sounds like completely contrary to that. Um, I had to add about thirty thousand words. So. Yeah. The original hundred thousand is is largely untouched. Um, wow. There were some edits, you know, and there were some insertions, like the 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 assassin in Galen's Veil vale with the snakes. That was new, yeah. um, you know. Some other, which I actually I love. That's one of my favorite chapters, actually. Yeah. Um, and uh, but what happened was um, initially are we in spoiler territory now. Not yet. Not yet. Okay. So initially it, it ended with the the courtroom drama. 
Um, and and, and oh. that was the kind of so much like Imperium did, like it ended with the big the prosecution, the trial court case, and that was the kind of that was the the denouement. Yeah. And my agent was like, I think we need something a bit more kind of explosive here. You know, if, you know, I think people have been building up quite a lot, and now we're, this is a bit of a fizzle like fizzling out. And he was absolutely correct. So a lot of what came after that, um, everything that came after that was was new. Um, yeah. And the book is much stronger for it, I think. Um, Very cool. But everything that came before that, you know, I got to a point in my writing about. I don't know, two, three, four years ago, where I was, I just kind of hit, I hit, I'd written so much that I kind of just hit my narrative stride and um, I can, I can turn out like a fairly decent, you know, my first draft now, literally just. Yeah. Didn't you say, didn't you write something like a, like a million words before you were 1. like. 1.3. 1. Yeah. Yeah. Million? Yeah. Yeah. So, cause I'd heard that uh, yeah, the first million words is, is practice. So, you know, you've got to get the first million words out and, I started self-publishing at the half million word mark and um but Justice of Kings was was my 1.2 to 1.3 million word arc so nice. you know and once you've written that much like you know it almost writes itself it yeah. almost writes itself you know yeah. you, you know you kind of know what you're doing a little bit so um I think book I think book two will have more edits um I think this there'll be a bit more structural shift in that one um gotcha. but uh well that remains to be seen Okay, well, we're about to go into spoilers. So if you've watched this far, thank you guys so much for watching. Um, please, well, by the time by the time this this video goes live, this book will be out. Go buy it and read it. It's so good, guys. Seriously, <laughs> freaking read this book. Like I, I give you like there's you. I'll give you my guarantee. Like you won't you won't dislike it. It would be impossible to read this book. I don't know. The yeah, guarantee. So go read it and then come back and watch the back half of this as we talk about awesome crap that happens and. Talk more about <laughs> the other characters like Claver, who sucks, and Weston Holt. That's his name, right? Yes, Weston that's his name, Margrave Weston Holt. Yeah, who sucks, and, he sucks. All, and all the other characters that bad dudes. Oh, we hate them. So, anyway, <laughs> so, so go, 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 go buy this book and then come back and watch this when you're tomorrow. I'm gonna give, we're gonna take a brief pause while you leave so you don't miss any spoilers because we're gonna jump right in. All right. This is where the the, the picture, the, the reframing picture appears now. It says yeah. spoilers, presumably. Yes. Boom. Look at that. Boosh. Yeah. Boosh indeed. So we're talking <laughs> spoilers now. So I don't even I don't even know where to begin. But we can talk about first of all, we can talk about Claver, who we have not talked about yet. And no. I hated this little sniveling guy from yep. chapter one. And the 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 zealot slash true believer is one of my mm. one of my favorite like villain archetypes just in general sure. so i and i also i also love uh like you know kind of crusade type stuff where it's you know the church What's versus, not to like? versus the government and everything and the fact yeah. that the fact that all these powers mm. th this is this is the, the the like unique part that's awesome the mm. fact that the justice's powers used to belong to the church Yes. right is, is that right yeah, yeah. that's right yeah yeah so i cool. i when i was writing the novel i wanted to um i wanted to give a sense of uh an empire that had a long history um and i i'm a huge believer when you're writing fiction um i love the the, the random fact or the random kind of truism that the characters know the historical event the kind of the well known but you kind of throw it in as a, a frisson of realism you know you and i when we're talking we wouldn't like take five minutes to explain how like a car works or you know like you know so we would just if i said churchill you know who in, instantly who i mean i don't have to say winston churchill the prime minister of you know, britain who was but so I, I think that's a very powerful storytelling tool um but in this case there's you know there's, there's a little bit of history that I've, I've written out you know behind it i know but um i wanted to get this uh, this idea that there had been this historic power transfer between the church and the state is as basically as part of the secularization of of the Soviet Empire, and um, so it's sort of like the reverse of the Roman Empire, if you like, yeah. um, before it Christianized. And um, I, I think it was something that obviously allowed this kind of almost inherited grievance across generations. So you have like nostalgic priests who were like, oh, you know, the good old days when when we had the greatest arcana, and it was a and, and you know. Helena is a you know slightly unreliable narrator. Obviously, like Claver, she hates Claver, so she's not going to give him like a, she's not going to say, oh, and he was this like handsome six foot five, you know. <laughs> exactly. That's that's another reason the structure works so well because yes, we get her perspective 
exactly these people and claver mm. might as well have you know horns and and cloven hooves right and and i it, it, to my mind as i'm writing claver is much more banal uh, a, a character than she than she writes him as yeah. you know clay claver is a guy who um is is not an impressive person um but has this way with He's, he's, he's tapped into the, what the common folk and the lords, you know, you've got these kind of, a bit like the Nazis did with the Prussians, you know, the old kind of, the so in my mind, like Haunesheim, which is a kind of big sort of old province, is that, that's, the, that's the Prussia of, of kind of like turn of century Germany. Yeah. It's a full of like a proud martial traditional folk. And Hitler did a great job. Well, I mean, the Prussians hated Hitler, but like he, he was able to um, sort of tap into that you know get to get the, even though the prussians didn't really agree with nazi germany as a whole you know, goals they they loved the idea of you know making war and and, 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 and if all the great prussian the greatest generals were prussians right they they did all the the, the, the interesting tactics and yeah. and i think you know what i wanted to get across was you get people like westenholz who who loves who loves battle he loves fighting he's a kind of he's a proud traditionalist man yeah. um and he sees and and as does Margrave von Gaia, who's the Margrave of Kerak, which is one of the big Templar fortresses in the south. Um, he sees Claver not as a uh, oh, this is an impressive, pious man who I'm going to rally behind, is as a vehicle to accumulate power for himself. Yeah. And so um, you know, they see that Claver is kind of tapping into he's just a very enthusiastic, sort of zealous young man. Yeah, who, he's in his twenties, isn't he? Like, yeah, yeah, he's in his twenties. So he's, he's never known anything other than the Empire and the Neiman yeah. Creed. But you know, von Volt, you know, it didn't exist when he was a teenager. Yeah. You know, the, it's a, the Empire's only like fifty years old. So, and von Volt's like forty-five. So, he's he, he's never done anything else. And I think he's kind of like solid at wholesale. So he is he is zealous and he's a pious guy. But he's also like, and he's got it's just again this idea of the silent majority he's kind of tapping into this idea these people's kind of fears and of the, of the other of foreigners and things and and so he's like oh you know give me, and and these lords are like yes crusades you know what, what and I, you think about medieval lords they lived for battle you know they loved that kind of stuff yeah and that was a chance to prove yourself and so margrave western Holtz is like this guy is like yeah i'm gonna hitch my car to this guy's wagon because i want to kill people i want to yeah. go to battle and do stuff and i can see you know, the the Mulyana patricians in the kind of the, the Senate who are kind of making a bit of a power grab as well. Um, and so lots of people, you'll see the Neiman Church as an institution, which, which, which would probably be originally quite reluctant or disdainful of someone like Claver. They see that actually he's very popular. So actually, well, we're going to kind of retroactively claim yeah. him for our... We were, we were always, we always thought Claver had, was onto something here. You know, we thought he, we think he's great. And what you'll see as the trilogy progresses is all of these institutions who've kind of adopted Claver and his zeal as a, as a, a method for achieving their own ends yeah. don't really realize what forces they're kind of grappling with and, and what Claver's kind of ultimate aims are. But I, as, as we go on, and obviously Claver, Claver is actually the antithesis of, of, a, of, a, of a pious man, you know, as, as is often the case. He hates <laughs> Von Vault. He hates him. He hates him and he hates the, he hates the secularization of the empire. Um, but he's also he's a bad guy and he's bad he's evil is a relative term but he's he's not a pleasant person and i he think burned uh, the village to the ground <laughs> yeah but you're but remember i shot erd not rex so like my moral compass is i mean i mean that's i mean that's true i i don't know which one of those is worse <laughs> flavor's the good guy he's the hero of the story <laughs> Flavor wouldn't have shot Rex. No, he wouldn't have done. He would have converted him to Neemanism. <laughs> and then had a Krogan <laughs> army at his back. Oh, God, guard. yeah. That's, oh yeah. God. Um, but the, so what I wanted to get across with Claver, and, and, and uh, this is good because we're in the spoiler section, but um, yeah. Claver is a kind of a guy who starts off as a kind of, it's, it's Paul Dano in There Will Be Blood. He's this yeah. kind of, um, he has this extern, external kind of almost, very impressive zeal but actually you see Paul Dana toward the end of there will be blood and he's like our oil is kind of running out and we need some money and you realize you know how much of that was like a front for his own kind of move movements and yeah. I wanted to portray Claver as kind of initially you know he seems to be like incredibly impressive um but actually like much as we've seen in the modern day and throughout history he he's one of these people who is forced to kind of adopt an increasingly extreme position as he becomes more prominent in the world and you see it you know you see it now you see people who kind of 
they start off and they kind of like if they're throwing grenades in from the physical grenades in from the sidelines and they're just these kooks and then they get more and more power and so they realize that the reason they've accumulated this power is because they're saying quite extreme things and so they keep saying more and more extreme things yeah. and so he becomes a victim of his own yeah. he, you become trapped in the, the story that you've built up around yourself yeah. and, and in so, chapter one claver is not like he's just they they treat him with scorn he's yeah he doesn't seem an, an annoying no I know. but then he comes and, then he comes he's got armies at his back right and you know as i say that like, and i think people lose you know margrave westenholz gives claver like you know however many hundred guys and then he, yeah. he's picking up all these people and he's kind of traveling south but and you know if you look at the history of the crusades the actual crusades um you know they were initially incredibly popular um people like throwing soldiers and money at them um and the templars made an absolute fortune out of it but the um i what i as i said what i wanted to do is is claver as a vehicle for ambitious lords to, to jostle for power and a, an ambitious church you can see using claver as a way of putting pressure on the emperor and the senate to have some at least a partial repatriation of these kind of these powers because because the, the magist magistratum doesn't use most of them you know they've kind of they've they've contrived to confine themselves to kind of a handful of investigative tools but as we as we go on we see there's a wealth there's this there's a whole kind of wealth of like horrifying powers here you know that that are kept under lock and key because for very good reason um and so the dreadus arcana is actually a much bigger wider more terrifying pool of of powerful magical tools um you know which claver obviously is able to tap into and he becomes yeah. more powerful I, so yeah i had forgotten at the end because i reread the end mm. where I completely forgot that one of the one of the magistrates is helping Claver. Like one yeah. of the like one of the order, Von Bolt said, yeah, yeah. is is uh like uh, I wait till you read that. book two. Oh, oh my gosh, <laughs> that's so freaking cool. That's yeah, like, yeah. I, I one of the things I'm most excited to see is more of the more of the other magistrates. Because we got um what's her name? August, is that her name? Something like that. August, yeah, yeah, that's go. right. And she has the she has the speak with animals power. Oh yeah, she. Does. That's right. Uh, she, she has does. the speak with animals power. <laughs> she did. Uh, uh, she is dead. And um, it's just oh man, like I wanted to do something quite shock. August, I was you know one of the things I wanted to do with August was like create like what a shocking moment. And I think you know it, 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 what happens to her. Obviously, she she dies, but she kind of doesn't die really. She, so she, her 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 body is alive, and she kind of gets put into a hospice. Yeah, but they they destroy her mind yeah and i thought in from my perspective that was almost like a, it would be it would have been better just to kill her outright and the way that they do that they just kind of a, a bot just destroy her effectively her brain and render her this kind of you know empty vessel um i that was supposed to be like my big sort of shocking moment like yeah. you're supposed to read that and think oh that's actually that's really grim um i thought it was worse than all of the violence put together what do you think what do you think of the violence by the way i've had I've been reading some feedback where people are like, "Yeah, the violence, you know, the violence is okay. There's not too much of it. It's not too bad." And I was like, "What?" It's like I, 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 I was re I really at pains to make that it was as horrible as I could make it. And it didn't. It's, a lot of reviews are, like, "Yeah, you know, it's not, it's not the worst I've read." And I'm thinking, "What are you reading?" It, <laughs> like, it's definitely, it's definitely not the worst I've read. In the really? moment, in the moment, it is in, mm. like what happens to freaking Bresinger is yes. just. Oh yeah, that's grim. It's yeah, it's yeah. brutal in the moment, but like yes. overall, okay. Mm. So the reason it does not feel like it is put in in order to be like, oh my gosh, just look, oh what a grim world I have. Sure. Like yeah, look yeah. at how everyone, like, everything. It it doesn't feel it. It feels exactly as violent as the situation calls for. Got it. Where okay. when it's extraneous, it calls attention to itself because it's like, does it really need to be like this? Yeah, yeah. Or are you just trying to? I you know, see. Do something. The shock, the shock value. Because yeah, the I'm, book is the book is not shot through with violence, but the one that no, is violent. No, but brutal moments when Von Vault runs that guy through without a trial because he has had enough. Like he has had enough. That's right. <laughs> yeah, enough of this. Oh bullshit. my gosh! And then the description of like you lingering on Weston Holt's hanging. What, what? I there's this funny. No, that's not a funny story at all. But there's a story. But I. With Western Holes, I, as I say, like this is not grim dark in the, in the sense that bad guys just get away with everything, and I, and I definitely wanted there to be some comeuppance for. Um, I wanted the reader to be like, yeah, you know what, you know, fuck you, you like, you suck, and I'm glad that you're having a horrible death, and you know, because ultimately those are the 
bits that we enjoy. We, we, you can. I don't like write. I don't like reading a really bleak novel. I don't want to get to the end of a book Same. and everything is horrible and you know nothing is really resolved and you know it's a, they've really like kind of lent into the moral grayness um, because you know stories are they are they're not real life. You know they they are curated versions of real life. They are yeah. fictionalized and. You know, I, I don't I don't take any satisfaction from watching bad guys get away with it. And um, and so I really I, I decided that quite early on that Western Holtz would, would die. Um, yeah. But I, I Googled, <laughs> which was an error. Um, what you're happens on a watch when, list now? If yeah, I know. I, I, what happens when you hang like when you hang someone? Because, you know, if you don't break someone's neck with the hanging, which is how they execute people, if you literally just hoist them up like. I was surprised then. You didn't die that quickly. Like you can, you just dangle there for like ten minutes or something. It's just so suffocating. Um, but of course, the first thing that comes up is like the Samaritans hotline. Like you know, don't don't do anything. I was like, oh good, no, I'm a writer. Like this is, I'm not gonna kill myself. Like, oh my gosh. And it was, and it was just this, and it was this horrible world. And all these, you know, these websites were coming up. Don't do it. You know, it's not worth your life. And, and so I was like, I wanted to make it brutal i mean hanging is a horrible way to die right I mean, it's horrible um and if you and don't yet hang, people used to bring their children to the hangings to in watch the it. public square yeah to, to to like until relatively recently as well yeah, which is, we're gonna go watch the hanging yeah like, have like a corn dog in, in your or something. country too let's go yeah. down and watch the hanging <laughs> just pull on his legs yeah. um but you know, all the all, it's like all the blood vessels are going to rupture in your face, and apparently, like it makes your tongue stick out, which is this grotesque kind of. And so I wanted, to, I was like, going to get all that in because I wanted, and I had him like you know, piss himself because that's what tends to happen. And, but it was, it was like, it was a horrible, you know, it's a horrible death. I didn't want to shy away from the violence. I didn't want to like sh make the book just needlessly violent. But when yeah. I wrote the violence, I wanted the violence to be very visceral, because ultimately it is. You know, if you hit someone in the head with a sword, nothing good happens. Um, and um, with the hanging, I wanted Weston Holtz's death to be just like a really horrible, you know, karmic death. Um, and, and you know, and it was. Um, so, but you know, I've seen people and they're yeah, you know, the violence is you know, it's pretty powerful, of course. And I'm thinking, Jesus, like, uh, you know. What are you reading? Like seriously, <laughs> I mean, it's not excessive, but it is brutal in the moment. The end of yeah, the sure, brutal. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that scene with Hanging Westenholt has is a mirror of a previous scene that has one of my favorite theme about the fact that Von Vault, because you know Von Vault arrests, like he arrests, like Westenholt. It's like you're under arrest. Like yeah, here we go. And Westenholt uh, says, "Okay, no." Yeah, and, I'm not coming with you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and he's like, but this is the freaking law. And he says, what does he say? That's the difference between a piece of paper and paper steel. And steel. Because yes, exactly. He's got, the ar he's got the army. And then at the end, when yeah. he <laughs> is a noble, so he does not get a hanging. You can't hang nobles. No. And he's like, you can't do that. Like the law, and he leans in and says, that's the difference between a piece of paper and steel. When I uh, was reading chills. it for the first time, Richard, <laughs> I, I got chills. I was like, yeah. I turned to my wife and told her the whole story, and she hates she hates violence. She's like, you know, "Great, thanks, Alan." She, she didn't want me to tell her <laughs> tell her about this guy getting hanged. Like, she yeah, was, yeah. She Fair is enough. a very very peaceful peaceful woman, <laughs> a gentle um, woman. But it was it was oh my god, it was so good. And then the, yeah, and yeah. then dealing with the fact that Von Vault's in the hinterlands, mm. he is relying on the fact that the that tradition says you obey you obey the authority of the magistrates. Mm. But only because people agree to obey the authority of the magistrates. Exactly. What happens if they say what no? When you, what happens when you don't? And I, and you and you are powerful enough to be in a position so that you don't. And I think that was the, you know, the fear was, you know, he, and everyone was saying you can't, you can't, you, like you don't know what's happening in Sova, but you can't just kill Messenholz because you're going to light a match to the touch paper. Yeah. Um, and uh, it, it's it, it's the real politique versus the lesser of the law. Um, and I wanted to kind of, you know, draw a distinction between, well, the Soviet Empire is this is this legal, it's an empire of law, it's an empire of the common law, but actually, you know, it's it, we're, we're backsliding into might is right again. And so uh, we're in that horrible world where even if you do the right thing, it can have entirely the wrong consequences. So we'll see what happens as a result of the hanging of Western Holtzman book two. Nice. Um, yeah, <laughs> and it's not good, but the, um, the <laughs> but it's, it's, you know, it's, 
I'm always at pains to kind of rein in, for better or worse, the, the, the scope of things. So I, I, as I said before, like you know, when you look at the collapse of the Western Roman Empire, and it, it was a slow process and it wasn't like an overnight, oh, everything is on fire and people are running around screaming and kind of, I wanted to kind of find a, a halfway house between that and, and the actual, yeah. what, what would happen. And so, you know, it's not like, when we go to Sovereign Book Two, there's 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 definitely a kind of a feeling of impending doom and, and chaos. But it's not like everything is on fire and people are running around crazy. You know, it's we are we are witnessing the, the, the slow the slow knife. Um, you know that the, the sort of the, the slow death and enemies are kind of are gathering. You know, husbanding resources and kind of you know using these these little tidbits to kind of you know, build up and, and kind of shore up their positions, but it's not like this explosive, you know, oh, fuck, everything has gone to oh, yeah. shit. That's, that's book three. Um, <laughs> and so, um, you know, but I, 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 one of the other themes which I keep forgetting to talk about is is this is this, 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 this idea of the butterfly effect. So, you know, how, um, and, and that's the, that's the, you know what that is, obviously, it's like how the, the tiniest little thing can have these kind of un, unintended consequences. And, yeah that's kind of the lens that we're looking through the, the afterlife as well, you know, and then we see in the afterlife, which is much, much more of an appearance in the second or third books, um, how the entities that kind of dwell in the afterlife, are, I I can see that what they call the temporal pathway, which is kind of like a, you know, the, the sort of the timeline of, of events and how different human people are affecting how that progresses. So Claver, you know, we're, we're having a bit with Claver if he ascends to the imperial throne, which is ultimately his goal. Um, we see a big branch in the temporal pathway down a kind of horrible dystopian future. And so it's kind of all this, um, you know, how, and so when Justice August is like, you've become entangled in this, in the, in these like world shaping events. And Von Volt's like, well, if I, we can't start second guessing ourselves now, you know, if I don't kill Western Holtz, that might be the wrong decision to do. Yeah. That, you know, the, the outcome, so it kind of drives you a bit mad thinking about how your actions may affect the future. Yeah, and then he's just, like, he's dealing with that murder case, and she's mm. like, you need to go back to the Empire. Like, yeah. bad stuff is happening in the capital. He's like, well, I gotta wrap this up first. I need to finish, <laughs> yeah. my, I need to finish my paltry murder trial in the hinterlands mm. rather exactly. than go with... Because, like you said, he, he doesn't really believe that, like, it's that no. big of a deal, you know? She's no. Probably and and it's, you know, it's exactly and it's one of those things and I'm, what i'm trying to capture in the book is like this idea that you know we as a we as a reader know huge things are happening big you know wheels are turning it's all you know going to the pot but when you are in it at the time you don't have this sense of wider events you know if you are witnessing things firsthand you know you, like you know nobody thought that the first world war could could end up the way it did and so yeah. when you analyze the first world war through the lens of history you think oh god all the signs were there you know the industrializations of the great powers you know etc cetera, etc cetera. um but of course at the time they didn't see it in those terms in hindsight is 2020 yeah. and so what i wanted to get a sense of was von Waltz like yeah guys look the seven M, we have like a dozen rebellions yeah you know, there's always something going on like yeah. i can't just go tearing off every time exactly. something like this is happening i've got a job to do otherwise i'd never get anything done <laughs> um exactly. and uh, so you know i wanted to get that sense of yeah, well we know that the empire collapsed now mm -hmm. looking back but they didn't at the time at the time they thought they they made the same mistake that modern western powers make which is that uh, the claver is just a, a loony he's an he's, a, he's an insane upstart who we can safely ignore mm -hmm. not someone who we need to take you know, take care of in some in some way and so von Voltz, you know he doesn't arrest claver because he doesn't you know he doesn't august stops him he, he doesn't like you know do these things because well it's against the law or i don't have the procedure on my side you know, doesn't he try do to that. arrest claver and um western Holt stops him he tries to arrest oh. him for burning down real doesn't he <laughs> he does he try he's going to arrest claver on the Howner road and then august stops him because she's worried that if he does um it's everything is just going to explode um <sighs> so they uh, should have arrested should have just just kill him why don't you just kill him? You know, it's like based on, it's like if, based on Austin Powers. If, if he had done it in, uh, if he had done it on a back road where no one saw, how would it, how would it have come back to Von Vault? Oh, exactly. You'd never know, right? But um, that's what I love about Von Vault is his adherence to, because he does really try mm. to do the right thing. It is so yeah. much more painful yes. when he breaks it later yeah. like at the end of the book when he because we understand mm -hmm. what like we give him a buy 
for the for, sure. for the one on the road with with Weston Hall for the guy that he's just the, like the, the Templar, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like we give him a pass Fair for enough. that. Yeah, but it's 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 in the moment. It's in the heat of the moment. Something needs to be done. He exactly. arrested the guy. The guy resisted arrest. Whatever. You're in violation of the king's of the emperor's law. Yep, dead. But then with Weston Hall, like that is a much more calculated, like vengeful. Yep. It's it's he makes the decision out of vengeance. Exactly. And yeah, even yeah. though we, it is some justice has to be meted out. Like of course. So it is a. I mean, it's not a just decision, but Weston Holt is receiving bad guy. consequences mm. for what he did. Yeah, it's but, it's it's. Sorry, yeah, you go on. No, but it's not. But he's not. He's not doing it the way that you know he's supposed to do it. And so, yeah. watching him compromise mm. because every yeah. time you compromise, it's easier to compromise the next time. Exactly, and that makes me so sad. It's because, supposed to be. It's supposed to be heartbreaking, you know. Uh, ultimately, that's the that's the that's the line, isn't it? And 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 you're absolutely and with Fisher as well. You know, these these are these are bad people who have done bad things, and you know, but for a procedural nicety, they would have been killed. Um, but he doesn't have that procedural nicety on his side, and I and I think you know we're we're looking at the, the example I gave you know, the other day. I was talking to someone about it was. Mace, Mace Windu, right, in the Revenge of the Sith, is going to execute Chancellor Palpatine in, in what is absolutely an extrajudicial killing. Uh, he's got him in his chambers. As far as everybody is concerned, Palpatine is unarmed. Um, but he's an evil person, right? So this is your, this is your classic consequentialist versus deontological ethical dilemma. Does the end, is it better to kill him and have the good consequences of, of having killed him? Or is it inherently wrong to kill somebody and therefore you can't do it in, yeah. in, irrespective of the consequences and you know if you watch that and you think mace windu is absolutely right to, to do it even though to do it would be to, to commit murder which is essentially what he's about to do that is that moral dilemma is at the core of the justice of kings you know and helena you know she sees von volt he's always been such a stickler i know like and that's a comfort for her because he von volt is the, the rules are absolute and i'm going to stick to the rules yeah and then obviously he he you know what is commits what is effectively murder on about three or four people throughout the course of the book um because he doesn't have that that procedure and so it's kind of like uh i mean i wanted these people to die but not you know not like this you know yeah. I, I didn't i didn't want them to die like this i wanted them to die and so it's about like it's the, the and Bressinger says it he's like i've seen what the world is like we don't have the rules you know mm -hmm. um it sucks and it's it's better there's an old there's an old adage in english law which is it's better to let um 10 guilty people go free than then convict one innocent innocent person or something like that um and so once you start to violate these laws and the societal norms which led to those laws because everybody benefits from a an absolute system of justice like there's no no there are no losers in that situation and um to see him violate his code of ethics even though the just outcome it, it's 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 more of a sad thing it's a it's a yeah i i didn't enjoy that as much as i I wanted to enjoy. I wanted to watch Weston Holtz die, but he should have been decapitated by a sword, you know. And, yeah. And because Helena's Weston like, was convicted. Like he was sentenced to die. Von Vol yep. just just gave him a hanging instead of you know the right. quick death that he was exactly owed. Yeah. Yeah. And that was and and Helena's like you know oh I'm not so you're gonna read this and you're, I'm so high you know I'm not so high minded to think Weston Holtz should have been let go. You know yeah. that obviously would have been unjust, but Von Vol hanged him, and it's not. It's not permitted, and you know you can't just start picking and choosing how you enforce it. And so it's that kind of slow, you know, moral decline, and that obviously gets a bit worse in book two and, as well. And then in the in the in the, the epilogue, like the last chapter, when they're heading, like, it, like it, it's that last chapter is so good. It's just that that Thank stark you. contrast <laughs> where they're going. Yeah. Helena figures out where they're going, and yeah. she's like, "But," and he's like, "I don't want to. Like, I'm not going to talk about this. Like, I'm not yeah. going to talk about this. I, yeah, good. You figured it out. You're as smart as I think you are." yes we're not going to talk about this and he goes and the guy you know any uh ober ober patria um fisher fisher yeah, yeah. And he's like you you can't you know you can't kill me or whatever and he tells yeah. the story about and this is where the title of the book comes in always love that yeah, yeah. where he's like <laughs> you know if the people got it wrong if the people yeah. got it wrong in the in the trial the mm. king had the had the authority to overturn it if they if he yeah. thought that justice wasn't done and yeah, it's called yeah. justice, the king's justice, justice of kings. And he's like, this is the emperor's justice because Von Vault 
is the executive branch of uh, got the it. right now. That That's is it. a dangerous path. Absolutely. That is a dangerous precedent to set to it, say it that, is. oh, well, there, there's this, this, this really old legal thing that gave the king <laughs> the right to decide. And, you know, the emperor is just a new king, really. To yeah. decide that the people got it wrong. Mm. Well, now you can at any point, if they, yeah, did they get it wrong or did they just do what you didn't want them to do? Exactly. That's it. You know, and I, I, I so good. the death of Fisher is supposed to be a kind of, a sort of Shakespearean tragedy might be a bit of a over overstating it a little bit, but it's supposed to be a, a tragic turning point in von Volt's, you know, life. And as Helena says in the book, like he didn't, he didn't just transform overnight into a fundamentally evil person, you know, yeah. like von Volt in book two is, is pretty similar to von Volt in book one. It's just, yeah. he, he has a much more laissez-faire approach to how he achieves his ends now. Because Fisher um, had his trial, right? Wasn't Fisher let go? The trial was interrupted, oh, um, gotcha. so they never actually passed a, a verdict on, on any of but them, which is why. No, um, but yeah. neither was neither were Bauer and, and Vogt. They von Volt just butchered them. They, you know, they weren't convicted either. So yeah. they were all effectively murdered. Um, and so it's that you know, and from Helena's perspective, she sees this as the as the great tragedy. And in in book two, what we see um, is not necessarily that. Uh, I don't know. I don't want to spoil the book for you, but the, you know, let anybody else. <laughs> but it's it's this idea that Helena maybe is being a little bit naive in book one, and maybe von Volt isn't hasn't always been this mm. paragon that you know she that you know he she, he seems like he is. I but I just believe that. I <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not true. Stop ruining my childhood. Um, Volt was it is it is Claver and these freaking Margraves that have forced von Bolt into this position it is oh it, and it is it's 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 the, it's the real politique aspect oh and this is why von Bolt hates over you know and he and we, and we go there and he's miserable he's like i hate this because every, every you know everybody here is you know it's it's also duplicitous and political yes. and yeah. that's why i like the hinterlands because I know what the law is. People have to do it. They can't possibly like doing about it. Like, and you know, you're dead. In Sova, it's much more equivocal and, and grey area, as of course you would expect. Yeah. And um, and so you know, he hates it. He hates he hates the sort of the political aspect of it. And he's no good at it either. You know, he doesn't he doesn't like it. It's, and I, he and doesn't strike me as a good as a good politician. He's, he's yeah, he isn't. He's a, he's a Ned Stark. You know, he's yeah. he's too honest for it. He's the one that gets mowed over by the people who are good at exactly. it. Exactly. Exactly. And I think. Um, you know, with with Von Vogt, the, the the real turning point comes when we find out why Bressinger is so loyal to Von Vogt, um, oh, cool. and, and we cool. find that out in book two, um, and that is a a real turning. That's toward the end of book two, and that's a real turning point in. That's more of a turning point in Von Vogt and, and Helena's relationship than cool. than the murder of Oban Patrick Fisher. So, and, and then we kind of see, ah, you know, was he. Was it always this yeah. you know, sticklerish, or was there has there always been more to it? And I've just von Volt has been this almost deity in my eyes. And yeah. the longer we go on, actually, I'm seeing that maybe he wasn't that. Um, and since so these are kind of the themes that we carry through into the second and third books, I wanted to mention. So I've as a someone who's played Dungeons and Dragons his whole life, like my right. my experience with necromancy is, you know, it's necromancy, it's whatever. But it's I'm gonna, you know. like I look at that dragon. It's a Lego dragon, look. There you go, Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> I love Legos, but they are so expensive. Like I can't, uh, I, I can't afford Legos. Those I, th they, they. Sorry, I just, I, I love sorry. it. I, my wife bought me a Lego castle for my birthday uh, for Christmas. That's uh, awesome. I'm a huge uh, Star Wars prequels fan, um, which is, you know, I grew up with them, so like I love them. But um, Richard, th like if the Erdnot Rex thing didn't didn't chase people off, now you like the rest of them that stayed are now gone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Also, to me, just hearing me, well, how long have I been talking? About an hour and a half. Like, unless you were like a diehard fan of the Justice of Kings, you've probably switched off by now. No, 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 no. People are watching. People are. I've paid them. I've paid them. All. Uh, okay, fantastic. The <laughs> I'm gonna get the you know the Republic gunship. Yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna get the. They have a massive Lego set of that. Like as of about last year, I'm getting it for my birthday. Nice. Um, they have a Colosseum one too, but it's like they do multi hundreds of dollars and I'm yeah like, yeah 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 know. i mean you're burning through some disposable income on these things for sure justice of kings right. yeah, <laughs> no, yeah. Just focus yeah 
I am like, I was so impressed mm. because, you know, I've read fantasy for forever. And like, like you said, like violence is just like, ugh, like I've seen it. Eh. Yeah, yeah. The necromancy scene in this book is horrifying. Good. It, this is not a horror book, but no. it is, it is uncomfortably. Yeah. Like yeah. it is just unsettling. It is really, really well written to where oh, you. it is. I mean, it's mm. not just gross, and it's not talking to the dead. It, it just like, oh, let me let me summon them. Oh, you know, yeah. hello. Oh, what do yeah. you want to know? You know it's, <laughs> what do you want to know? I got yeah. five minutes. <laughs> it is horrific, and yes. seeing it from Helena's perspective, where and mm. you know, Von Vault and Bressinger are both like, you should not be. You here definitely don't want to see this. this. Yeah, yeah, and she, when it's done, is like, I definitely did not want to be. Here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I I regret that. Oh my God. <laughs> I, I made it, a mistake. It is so. Like, yes. What what influenced that? Like, what made you mm. write it that way? I what I wanted to do was after I'd basically come up with the the powers that Von Volt had. Yeah, which was the Emperor's voice and necromancy. I realized that it would be a tremendously short book if those things just worked, you know, all the time. So it was Makes it sense. was yeah, so it was about so what what I did with the Witch of Real, which is the first it was the first chapter, now it's the first two chapters. What I did with that is I wanted to do the use case. I wanted to do like uh if this was a standalone short story this is what this is how it kind of goes you know so it's kind of like a, the first five minutes of a movie or something you know, yeah. you know pre pre-credit scene and then the rest of it is like what happens when it, all, when it all goes wrong or it doesn't work and i think with the necromancy and the emperor's voice i thought you know we need to have limitations for these things otherwise you know people are rightly going to say you know why doesn't he just do xyz you know this could be an extremely short case and so it's a combination of the limit the the arcane limitations the kind of the high cost of you know the energy expenditure and also it's like the procedural limitations you know we live in a secular legal society now you can't just go around like clubbing confessions out of people we have to have a we have to have some kind of process around this otherwise it's you know and so with the necromancy what i wanted to do was you know, I wanted to make it so limit, limitation number one is that it only, it only work if someone gets crushed by like a 10 ton slab of granite and they are just, you know, paste. Yeah. yeah then that's it. You know, game, you know, game over. There's nothing to commune with. Right. So uh, number one, the body has got to be relatively intact. Right. Number two, the body kind of decompose. So the idea is in, in, the, in the book, in the afterlife you kind of you go into the, the what's called the plane of burden which is kind of like this kind of purgatorial part of a, a broader purgatorial plane called the adaxime and you kind of go into it and you kind of loiter there for a bit and then you kind of like drift into the, wherever you're going to go after that um and it's it's in that specific point in time where you can you have just about enough time to kind of grab them and question them if you if you and if, it, if, it, if, it, if you leave it like a day of the corpse is like a day or two old you've missed your chance like they've already kind of passed passed beyond so you're kind of like you can you can commune with them but only when they're still in this kind of liminal space mm -hmm. And the, and the third limitation I, I wanted to do was if they died in like a, in a particularly horrible way, if they are murdered or stabbed or they hate you, if you're the one who's killed them, um, they are, their heads are kind of like this, this miasma of horrible negative emotion, kind of hatred and terror and fear. And so when you go into the afterlife, which is kind of populated by these entities um you know sort of demonic entities sort of some of some are malevolent and some some are not they just they just exist yeah um they they are kind of predatory on human souls and so if you have this kind of like oh i've been murdered ah, i'm terrified it, it's like a kind of almost like a psychic beacon and you just these entities are attracted to it and that makes it physically dangerous to, to kind of commune with that person oh, and so it, i wanted to make it this like really sort of hor horrifying experience so it's it's a, an incredibly powerfully powerful investigative tool so von can be like who murdered you and they'll be like oh it was that guy like case closed you know yeah. um <laughs> but um but if it be in almost any other circumstances it's really horrible and so you know this bit when von Bolt does it with Sir otmar frost you know so Otmar, his his corpse was basically preserved by the cold. You know, mm -hmm. he asked Von Bolt for help, so they were kind of like on friendly terms, and Von Bolt was able to kind of get some information out of him. But with Graves, you know, he died in very horrible circumstances, and so when Von Bolt goes in to sort of see him, that very quickly the, he's essentially possessed. You know, he's yeah. possessed by a, a you know sort of like malign entity. And what I wanted to do with this Ugh. this thing is, is is make it is make it you know really hard quite terrifying um which sounds like you know, it was which is good it, um, it definitely was for me 
sure. and my my personal favorite scene in the in the entire book is is the bit that follows that so when von Bolt is kind of explaining to Helena, Helena what happened and he's like yeah you know what like and he's lying to her okay so he's saying um sometimes you know when we, when we do this uh, an entity can you know interrupt the process and, and kind of make mischief and it's frightening but there's no danger you know and Helena's like I'm pretty sure he was lying, but you know, I, want, I wanted, I wanted the comfort, and I wanted just a hint at this idea that the afterlife was a real place. Number one, um, that it was a place that was populated by entities, and some of those entities were malevolent. Um, and so, and I think that's for me personally, like. I can watch like any movie about like all kinds of torture and murder and horrible things and be completely unaffected by it. But I'll watch like paranormal activity and I'll sleep with the lights on, you know, <laughs> like that thing really spooks me out. And I think there's something very viscerally frightening about the idea of the, un the as Donald Rumsfeld would say, the unknown unknowns or the known unknowns. You know, we know that there are entities there. We know that some of them are malign or certainly what we would think of as malign or malevolent um but we don't understand why you know and, and it was that kind of that horror of what you don't know and you don't see and we laugh the life is is a thing that's explored much more in book two and three and i think readers would probably be a bit annoyed if it wasn't but the um yeah. and so we kind of codify a bit more about what's going on there and there's lots of trips into into and out of it and that forms a fairly key part of the narrative but for book one i wanted to keep it very much a because a lot, a lot of people will only ever read book one they won't read the whole trilogy um and so i wanted to have an in book one was this really quite terrifying experience and so, and so von vault is von vault is a he, a like pretty much everybody, he has some form of PTSD, right? He was a soldier in the Rice Creek. You know, he's seen some horrible yeah. things. He's, he's done horrible things. So he's like, he's like, a, he's a quiet guy. He's a serious guy. You know, he doesn't like to talk about a lot of things. And to to pile on that, there's the necromancy as well. You know, and he's only human, right? And what we, Helena thinks that von Volt knows what he's doing with the necromancy, and he does to the extent that the Magistratum knows what it's doing with necromancy. But Helena has a conversation which you may or may not remember with Open Patria Fisher in the in the in the, in the monastery. And he's like, look, it's it didn't used to be like this. You know, you used to be able to commune with the dead, and it was like a, a hap not a happy experience, but it was like a kind of a it was a respectful process, and you know, it was a great way of like helping grieving families and stuff. And since the kind of the secularization of it and the, the loss of some of the, the law, it's become this very brutal, almost like a grave robbing. You know, process like we're kind of smashing our way into the holy dimension, and we're kind of we're we're, we're it's like a it's like a deposition, and we're kind of questioning this like soul as it's kind of struggling to pass on, and it's a it's just this horrible, you know, it's like it's like exhuming a corpse, yeah, and you know, it's it's supposed to be a horrible thing, and so part of it is plot contrivance. I can't just have von Vault questioning the dead very easily because yeah. then it kind of ruins the story, um, but also, but then leaning into that, it's well, how how horrible can we make it you know and you know i like a little bit of horror in, in my books and you know that, that there's a little bit more of that in book two as well um which uh you know is quite spooky as well so i really enjoyed writing that oh my gosh i yeah. um, oh my gosh like <laughs> I, don't even, I don't even know oh i can transition into first of, first of all i need to ask is there an audiobook for Justice of Kings? I, I, yeah. I forgot to look. There is? Who, there is, yeah. Lucy Peterson. Um, she's done a lot of, um, she's English, and she's done a lot of, like, thrillers and things. I don't know wow. if she's done much SFF, but um, but she had the right, her voice had the kind of the right timbre. Nice. For, for um, this, so, yeah. And you are almost done writing the third book, right? Uh, uh, I am 30,000 words into it, so... My yeah, so my my second book is out for edits, and I should be getting that back in the next couple of weeks, um, and then that will completely freeze efforts on book three. Um, the great thing about like having writing book three now, as I say, I'm about thirty thousand words in, thirty five thousand yeah. words in, is it, it enable and, and having it in its draft form enables me to then once I go back to book two and edit it, I can start to more better weave gotcha. the different storylines you know, together to make sure that the so one thing i was able to do in in um but whilst whilst writing book two and book one was in edits was go back and add in a few nice little so if you look at when helena comes out of the afterlife after that necromancy scene she has a sequence of visions right which you read and they mean nothing but 
eagle eyed readers uh, will see those. I, things. I wrote those down in my notes. I wrote Did you? those <laughs> down in my notes because yeah. you don't see something like that and not like, oh, okay, how's yeah. that going to come to fruition? I yes. I will find my notes for that. Do it because they all play out. Nice. They um, all play out. When should people expect? The second book, like same time next year, right? Yeah, it'll be February twenty three. So it's they're all a year apart, sadly. Yeah, it's uh, it's a long process. Um, I sold Still, the trilogy in a year 20... apart is better than you know, oh yeah, of course. Five yeah. Years. And, and they definitely, I mean, and they definitely will be. Like I, you know, I will finish book three in its entirety this year. Um, like no, 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 probably the next six months. Like the whole the whole lot will be done. Um, yeah. So you know, and then What's I'll be on to. What's book two called? Book two is called. Uh, they will change it. What is um, it current? What is it currently called? It's currently called the Son of Sova. The Son of Sova. What was this one called to start with? The Emperor's Justice. Um, so, yeah. why did they change it to Justice of Kings? You only use that uh, once, at, like at the end. No, no, no. That was that was retconning it. That was. Oh. Um, okay. Yeah, that was a retcon. The um, it was originally called the Emperor's Justice, which is you know, for, for very obvious reasons. Um, and then I I suspect. Yeah, um, I, and then I sus I suspect that it was more to do with um, well, Orbit told me. I mean, we had we had a bit of a back and forth about it, um, and basically they said the Justice of Kings. I said I don't like it. Um, yeah, there are no kings in the, there are no kings in the novel. It's you flat out told them like I don't like it. Yeah, 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 but I mean that's the relationship that I have with you know my editor. Like I, you know, no one benefits if we kind of dance around these things. So. Also, I'm a litigator, Alan. Like, <laughs> um, so I, I don't really like it. Like, here are a bunch of alternatives I've thought there of, no but you kings. know, yeah. there are no kings. About, and um, and they said, you know, it's it's not it's not necessarily about. It, we were looking for titles and covers that are kind of thematic and that kind of evoke certain things, but they don't have to be like ultra faithful to the novel. You know, is there any way we can kind of shift some of the world building around? And I said no. Um, but then I did do that thing at the end, which you've referenced, the Justice of yeah. Kings, which I which I do like, you know, and I like that, and I actually like, and I think it fit very nicely. And there was some, there was a speech that more or less did the same thing in the previous iteration of the novel, so it wasn't like just you know plucked out of thin air. Okay. Um, but it was, it was, so it was originally going to be the Emperor's Justice, Son of Sova, and the Empire of the Wolf. And then the Empire of the Wolf again, the series title, changed the first one to the Justice of Kings. So the current title, the current title is the Son of Saber, but it, it won't be that. They will, they will change that as well. But that's the working. How title. do you know they'll change it? I just know. Um, <laughs> I sent my editor an email. He was like, um, "Oh, let's let's talk about um, cover cover ideas and title for book two. Kind of like, what are you thinking? Because I don't, I personally don't like. There's a real trend in fantasy novels at the moment to have. Uh, the same elements in each title throughout the book. So you have like, oh, you know, priest of crowns, priest of thorns, priest, of, you know, emperor of thorns, emperor of like, you know, black, and it will follow it through. And you know, it's no reflection on the book at all. It's just the titles I don't like. And you can you can see the the hand. You know, if it were a movie, that would be the the studio's hand at work there. Um, and I don't like that at all. Like you know, as a matter of personal preference, and um, I don't see the the argument whatever arguments there are for it and, and maybe there's some kind of like brand recognition argument or maybe there's a kind of i don't mean i don't really know but i don't really buy that yeah i think you could in this day and age of the internet and sat knowledge saturation there's no way we could call the second book anything and people would still know it was a sequel um so you know i don't i don't buy that we have to call it something like the justice of blades or you know the the wrath of kings or something you know Dang that's wrath. That, that's the that's the I, I know that's the way that they're gonna they're gonna push for that and I'm gonna push back because I I surrendered my right on book one title. <laughs> it's like the I let them call is, it the Justice like, of Kings. The Justice of Kings, I mean, with what you've added, it makes sense. There's nowhere mm. else to take that title, like no. the king's aspect. There's nowhere else to take the king's thing, because there's no, no kings. There there aren't. And I, I said in my email back to Orbit, I was like, I mean, I'm I would be extremely keen to drop the of kings, you know. I it, it's not an appropriate title for the series. So I think that will go whether or not the justice element remains. Oh. Uh, you know, Dang it. Ref Orbit's going to blacklist, blacklist me now for saying these things. Like, Orbit's never going to send they me will. a dark ever They again. will. I'm sorry. I'll send you. I, I told you, I've got like 30 copies. I'll just send you one of mine. <laughs> <laughs> is this cover, is this supposed to be Von Vold or is this the Emperor? That's, that's Von Vold. Yeah, it's Von Vold. I, um, I, yeah, Do you have any say now. in, like, that, that cover creation? Oh yeah, yeah. I um I I provided a fairly detailed 
description of him. Well, I, I provided a, a, des a description of him and kind of like gave him like a kind of mood board, you know, on Pinterest. And I love um, his puffy collar. Like, yeah, the rough. Yeah, yeah, the Jacobean rough. I um, I, I sent them a, I sent them a. It was a painting of like something random, like 16th century gentleman, and he had like a kind of you know the rough and a kind of like a medallion and a kind of like a ermine trimmed cloak and, and i was like this is kind of the thing i'm going for like he, he he is an official of the crown so as much as we would like him to look cool you know he's gonna look like a bit of a dork isn't he he's got, he's got like this formal kind of court robe aristocrat yeah 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 um what i was really really pleased though was they they included the um the Sovan short sword which is which is the oh. is, which is a gladius you know which is and i originally called it a gladius and then i changed it because i didn't want it to be a bit too roman yeah um uh, but it is a, it is a gladius essentially and so they're, they're, and i'm really pleased that they included that because initially they were like well we might just do like a regular sword and i was like no you know the, the Sovan short sword is 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 what the klashnikov is to the to the soviet you know, yeah. union it's it's emblematic of this you've got to have the short sword yeah that's you know that's the, so they did so they did do that and then um yeah, do they have a two-headed wolf in that cover My, i don't have that cover so i don't i don't oh do you know uh, it's it, it's a kind of like a, a a riff on that so they have this kind of like throne and it's got like a couple of gotcha, wolf gotcha, gotcha. headed kind of angelic figures there i think it's fantastic i love this cover yeah uh, i love it too i'm waiting mm. i'm waiting to get mine it seems like everyone in the uk has a copy of it yeah uh, and i do not Let's so deliver I'm, it we all hate you Alan. <laughs> I, I know that to be a fact um is... in, in addition Mm. I asked you this um, in, in in the previous interview. I, are you planning on writing more in this in this world? Like after this trilogy, um, is it going to be? Will it be separate from? Like, will it not involve Helena? Like, what's? I, I think what's Helena's. Right? I think Helena's story will be will be done with this trilogy, and I, and I think you know I I don't want a kind of. This... Helena's vo narrative voice is one of the great strengths of this series, and I think it can only be diluted like the more you write in it. Right. So I'd be quite keen to tie that one off. I think I, I did have a chat with um, with James, who's again is my editor at uh, well, and my agent, because I was like, look, I'm I'm going to finish this all quite quite quickly, you know, you know, years ahead of publication of book three, and can we get an early steer on you know pro projects that come after it? And you know, they were like, we we just don't know when you know how this is going to go, like it. If it doesn't sell very well, or whatever, because ultimately this is a business, um, so we we can't. But I mean, in my head, I would love to just keep writing in the Empire of the Wolf, but like every time, just time jump a couple of centuries, and and just keep going, you know. And and I, I've dropped a few kind of, you know, we know about the Wolf Men on the Southern Plains, and they make a huge appearance in Book Three. There's also, excuse me, references to like this kind of race of mermen which live in the Jade Sea, and oh, and, and so. Yeah, yeah, the Stygian mermen. So, like, in the in the lore of the the novels, there was this kind of this magical cataclysm, and the and the big effect that I had was to kind of fuse a lot of creatures together in the kind of the epicenter of it, which is where the wolfman came from. Yeah. Um. And so, in my head, I would maybe do like another trilogy, which was set like a hundred or two years later, and it'd be like a multiple, you know, your more classic kind of multiple third party perspective, but like carrying through this theme. So, you know, what was the frontier is maybe now another country, or you've got like some kind of Sovan rump state that kind of still exists, but does it, you know, a bit like the Holy Roman Empire or, you know, whatever. So, uh, you know, I've got a dozen ideas and I'm reading Jade War at the moment, you know, the Jade, Jade, Jade yeah. Greenbone saga. And I was like, man, imagine like bringing it all that's like modern day, you know, <laughs> and like having, because you don't see fantasy novels that are, you know, wolf men and, and mermen, but like, because in my head, it's just this great idea. And it was like, what if you had like kind of World War One setting, but like, where the fantasy races have all kind of grown up together over centuries. And so you have like these mermen and they're like planting mines on the side of submarines and things, oh my you know, gosh. you know, have that you, kind have of. Have you pitched this to orbit? No, uh, no, no, not yet. But this is this is kind of like my Marvel Cinematic Universe. This gotcha. is like me, kind of like it's the, the the delirious ravings of a madman. And and they, I don't know what will happen. I mean, they might say, for example, it's selling really well. Would you consider doing like another book in the Empire of the Wolf series? You know, make it like a tetralogy or something. Or it's not. Yeah, it's not doing great. Then let's revisit something else entirely and, and i think a travesty that would be a travesty <laughs> a miscarriage of justice it would be I mean... a miscarriage of justice <laughs> and i would know on the scene <laughs> that's right i love the idea of, once you have a universe that's like richly fleshed out it seems like such a waste to then yeah. abandon it in favor of something else like i love the idea of just continuing to develop it in, in through different lenses and you know i had this idea of like a kind of like sort of like a almost like a um Confederate kind of cavalryman 
on the southern plains like leading a kind of massacre of wolfmen like you know 200 years later when we've got like rudimentary gatling guns and things so you know just keep all these ideas are kind of just floating around but unfortunately as i say we're just so so far ahead of the curve god knows and i need to be. get the emperor's voice so i can on a video say bye <laughs> <Dr. Zuckerberg." laughs> yeah. so Do, they're all you, buy it. knowing the emperor's voice it probably doesn't work unless you're in person or something you know it, it's it, pro it probably shit doesn't down. Yeah. or anyone who's waiting for it like well, yeah they, well exactly Alan, yeah alan's about to hype this they just turn it doesn't work for anything that i promote because i promote Nothing. like because i'm easily excitable mm, the but, five star strumpet look i can't help that i that i like the books that i read i'm not and, complaining you know i like a lot i there are many things that i like or mm. that i love and then there are even more things that i like and then there are more things where i'm like you know what this is good yeah. it's not my thing but someone else will probably like it there's yeah, very yeah, few yeah. things that i'm like this is i know i hate this like, I yeah hate this. i know same but i think you just get more you one gets better at picking what they read as, as you know the yeah other. like i'll be i'll be 40 this year which fills me with great sadness so oh. you know i've been reading for for freaking ever i read Sorry, dungeons man. and dragons books for you know a yeah. decade. I've read every Forgotten Realms book published prior to 2008 or whatever. <laughs> Good man. Yeah, yeah. I used to be big into those um, Choose Your Own Adventure books. Yes! <laughs> yeah. I always made sure when I finished them, I went back and read how I died. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, you, you keep your finger on the page, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. You never just go and never go in blind. You know, no, you turn back you if your... it was a bad one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get your insurance. I used to read the virtual reality ones are my favorite. You know, your green blood and your necklace of skulls and those kind of ones. They were... Oh, um Oh, what a trip. That's anyway. fantastic. Well, Richard, thank you so much for giving up uh, two hours of your time to talk about oh, this. My pleasure. This fantastic book. Everyone, thank guys, y'all have heard me talk about this book. A bunch, a bunch of y'all have read it now. So go out, like street team the crap out of it, <laughs> hand it to, like Richard, get 30 copies, <laughs> hand it to people in the grocery line, hide it That's behind right. the produce. So <laughs> you know, when grandma goes to grab a melon... <laughs> She picks up a copy of Justice of Kings. And it's smell I've ever seen. so, 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 so excited. But And the good thing is if it's out next year at the same time, then that means arc season is going to be before, before we know it. They're gonna That's be a good point, those, actually. The arcs of book two are six months away or something. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Oh. Yeah, right. I am. I, I, I told you, Alan, I'll just send you the Word document. You can have it now. I'll do it when the call is finished. <laughs> yes. Yeah, suckers. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, anyway, thank you so much for talking talking with me. Pleasure. Um, this thank is, you for having me. It's a really enjoyed it. Book, and I hope you will come and talk to me. Talk to me more. I am happy to be Absolutely. the guy that you just want to talk about your book with. Because, My hype beast. Yeah. I'll Thanks, Alan. I'll, I'll hype it anytime. Uh, so I'm going to close this. I'm going to end this broadcast. Don't go anywhere just yet. Um, bye, guys. And oh, all all of Richard's social media will be, will be down in the. Um, in the description and where you can buy it. So make sure you follow him on all the, the platforms and then, you know, promote the book so that he can write more in this world. Exactly.